What up? What up? What up? Podcast party people. How you doing? How you living? This is uh this is appropriate. This is Sunday. Sunday that I'm doing the intro to this interview, separate from the day that I recorded it. But it's on a Sunday. As it should be. Tell you what, I'm fuck I have worked out so goddamn hard this weekend. I am so fucking sore. <laughs> I can't even tell you. My legs. It was leg day on Friday. Woo! The brutality. Savagery. Savage animal, man. I'm a savage animal. Feeling good, though. I love it. I love when I got that burn. I love, Well, that was abrupt. I love when I got that burn. Feels good. Feels good, man. A good hard workout. Super hard. My my gym is not open, but they've been having classes outside. And so they've been kind of doing, they, they got these portable little squat racks, portable little bench press racks, and then we do the medley, which is like a combination of things to get warmed up. Oh, my God. It's crushing. Crushing, man. Crushing. I, uh, man, I am stoked with the guest we got today. Stoked. Dudeski. From Poland, the Dudski got Nurgle from Behemoth. I tell you what, it's a great interview. You're in for a long one, three hours. It was an epic conversation, man. We went all over the place. And, uh, you know, I got to say, it's it's funny. Like, when I talk to some people, and I've always kind of just noticed this in, in general. Like, sometimes I talk to people, and they're like just an open book, and you can ask them anything and they'll just talk about anything and they just don't fucking care. And it's rad. Like it's awesome. And then and it's funny, like, especially since I started doing the podcast, you know, like I, especially sports figures are very guarded about the stuff that they talk about, you know, and even some band members, you know, like some band members just, you know, some band members just like, they don't, they don't want to talk about, you know, like, I don't want to say it's boring, but, you know, sometimes it's a little, you know, like they just don't want to go there. They're worried about their fans or they're worried about offending somebody or whatever. Man, talking to Nurgle, dude does not give a fuck. He gave me gold. Gave me gold. You know, just was really cool. It was really cool. And I always appreciate it when they do. I appreciate it when people come on here and just kill it for me. You know, like I know that they want to kill it and I know that they want to give a good interview and that makes me happy. You know, it makes me stoked. He, uh, so it was great. We talked for a long time. It was really, really, you know, I really liked the guy. You know, my manager too. My manager, Joseph, is a big Nurgle fan. He, uh, I, th- I want to say we met, did he meet him on the, I don't know if he met him the same time as, as we did. I think my manager and I went to, we went to a, a behemoth show at Slim's and that's where Joseph met him. And we just hung out at the show. It was a great show. Fucking awesome show. I mean, just, I remember, I remember there was so much attention to detail in the light show. You know, like somebody probably, I would imagine Nurgle sat down with that light guy and they programmed every last little fucking detail, every move, every song break, every Everything was just so fucking, it was rad. I mean, it's just awesome to see that much effort put into a show. And, uh, and I'm sure not to say that they're like, I didn't have a lot to do with it, but I just think when you're, when you know the music and you wrote the music, you know, you're more inclined to have those little details accented. We ended up hanging out. We drank. It was super fun. Oh my God. It was a great night. We had a blast. Let's see. uh, Suicide. Tommy was there. Yeah, it was good. It was a no Tomek, not Tommy, Tomek. Suicide Tomek was there. It was a fucking rager. And then we had met them. We had met them on the 2006 Sounds of the Underground Festival tour. It was a it was a touring festival called Sounds of the Underground. Only lasted a couple times, but uh, they were on there. And I had been I had already been rocking to them for a couple of years. 
but had never seen them and had never even met them. And so, uh, and they ended up being super nice guys. They all come up to us after the show and gave us a bunch of Polish beer and like, hey, let's hang out. And it was fucking great vibe. You know, I remember him asking about, you know, that Through the Ashes was out and he was asking about that and Colin Richardson and, you know, I'd love to get Colin to produce the re- next record and, you know, stuff like that. So it was, uh, it was just good, good, t- good memories, good times. And uh, who else was on that? Gore was on the bill. In Flames was on the bill. As I Lay Dying, I, I think As I Lay Dying was headlining. Yeah, I think As I Lay Dying and In Flames were the co-headline. <sighs> Terror was on the bill. Terror was on the bill. Trivium was on the bill. Trivium was on. Trivium was on there. It was a solid tour. It was a fun, it was a fun little shebang. Short. Cannibal Corpse was on there. That's where I met George for the first time. Um, yeah, it was a good little run, man. And uh, and they were Behemoth was killing it. They were like fucking hungry, and you could just see it in their eyes. They wanted it. It was cool. Um, and then we played with them a bunch of. We did a bunch of festivals with them, and we just hung out with them from there or I've seen them when they came through town um, a couple of years ago I want to say like five years ago we rolled through Dansk and we got into town the night before so then I went Nurgle's got a club I went out to his club and we hung out and we drank beer and just wine and I actually went to his house we hit chilled at his we, that's right we went to his house for a little while we chilled at his house for a while and um, you know, he was kind of having a party it was like a, I want to say it was like a Saturday night or maybe a Friday night and so we were just chilling at his house for a while. We were talking about the new Slayer record. And then we went out to a couple of bars and a couple of clubs. And we were just hanging out. And then we ended up at his bar. And, uh, yeah, it was cool. It was a good vibe. And then he came up the next day and he jammed Davidian with us. He came and played my guitar. I, handed, I just handed him my guitar. He played Davidian with us on stage. And I just sang. And it was a, it was a fucking rocking show. A rocking show in Dansk. Or I think it's pronounced Danzig, but it's Gdansk. That's what it looks like. Gdansk. Danzig. Good vibe, though, man. That was somewhere on Bloodstone and Diamonds. And, uh, yeah. So, we had been in touch, kind of DMing. We probably DM on Instagram mostly, and then I was like, hey, fucking, let's do the podcast. And uh, And then I think my girl, shout out to Michelle Kerr. She kind of helped coordinate it. Michelle Kerr, she's awesome. Um, she's my press girl, and she's been she's been hooking up a couple of interviews here and there. It's been very awesome, so it's always appreciated. Always appreciated, puppet. It is always appreciated. Today's podcast is brought to you, presented by Nuclear Blast Entertainment. No, just Nuclear Blast, actually. Not even Nuclear Blast Entertainment. It's just Nuclear Blast. And then it is put out on the gas digital, gas digital network, not gas, gas digital network. They've got all kinds of awesome podcasts going on. They got the Jossa show. They got Legion of Skanks. They got a bunch of political stuff. They got a bunch of funny stuff. Go check out Gas Digital. They've got a whole plethora of cool podcasts. They are the ones who are bringing this to you every week. And they've been doing awesome. Always appreciated. And today's sponsor is Altamont Beer Works. Altamont Beer Works is, let's see, what do we got here? Altamont Beer Works Based out of Livermore, California, Altamont is a is an area. It's kind of like a it's a I want to say it's not a canyon. It's like a mountain side. It's a it's like the grapevine of the Bay Area. If you've ever been through the grapevine, it's just a mountain mountainous area that takes you to the connecting freeways. And at one point it actually had a concert for the Rolling Stones and the Grateful Dead play there, the infamous Altamont concert where uh, some people got stabbed. It it was kind of a disaster that's very famous in Bay Area folklore. 
And Altamont Beer Works, I met these guys. I used to take my boat to uh, the place, the building right next door to them and and get repaired when uh, d- during the summer when I was taking my boat out. And my, the guy there, my, Rick, was just like, hey, man, they got fucking awesome beers over next door. Why don't you go check it out? They're like a bunch of metalheads. And I went over there, and a bunch of people like were like, oh, my God, Rob Flynn, what's up? And so they like... They hooked me up, and then we came through there a couple more times and uh, just kind of became friends with them. They made a Machine Head beer at one point for my 50th birthday, and they have been, they've got to be one of the finest craft breweries in all of California. They are awesome. They have got the Basic Bitch 4-Pack, which is a She's Blonde, Light, and Refreshing. They've got a Berry White 4-Pack. Everything's in 4-Packs. You know, that's the thing now, the 4-Packs, right? It's a 16-ounce can, 4-Packs. Sparkling fruit ale bursting with natural raspberry and cranberry fruit puree. This beer finishes dry, mellow, crisp, and fruity, just like your favorite summer rosé wine, except it's actually beer. 4.7 ABV. They got windmill wheat, an easy-drinking crisp blonde ale brewed for those who love and play where they live. This Cali-style ale is crafted to be consumed year-round. 4.2 ABV. They got Caddyshack IPA, like the movie Caddyshack, except for it's spelled Caddy, C-A-T-T-Y. Drink it up, drink it, tea it up, crush it. Pay homage to the Simcoe Hop. This balanced IPA has a touch of crystal malt to complement the hoppy aromas and flavors of citrus, pine, and melon. 6.0 ABV. They've got, what do they got? They got Stratmo Juice. Bringing you the fourth beer of our West Coast Juice Series. This single IPA is 100% two-row and 70% strata and 30% mosaic hops featuring all the tropical goodness of mosaics in the addition of pine, strawberries, and pungent dank. And speaking of dank, their most popular beer, they got all kinds of beers that are based on weed. They got Maui Wowie 4-Pack. Maui Wowie, if you remember, was an old-school weed You know, slang for a weed strain. Single malt IPA that is light in body and color with soft bitterness. Mosaic and citra hops give strong aromas and flavors of guava, pineapple, and mango. 6.5 ABV. And my personal fave, the Nutty Operator. Nutty Operator is a peanut butter version of Smooth Operator, a smooth, rich, full-bodied oatmeal stout heavy on the oats and chocolate malt. This complex beer balances out with a medium roast character followed by huge flavors huge flavors of aromas and peanut butter like drinking a reese's peanut butter cup not quite but it is fucking delicious 5.8 abv no peanut allergy just so you know if you want to you could even combine the pb you get a pb and j if you combine the nutty operator and the berry white it's like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich they do crowlers they deliver all throughout california And I actually think that they even deliver outside of California. You'll have to go on and find for yourself. But I tell you what, if you go to their website and shop delivery, not pickup, but delivery, or actually delivery or pickup, and enter the code NFR, no fucking regrets, enter code NFR and get 10% off. That's right. Go to altamontbeerworks.com, shop delivery or in-store pickup, Enter the code NFR and get 10% off. All right. Let's go over here. Let's go over here right now. I'm going to take you to the first first album. This is the first album that is on Spotify. So I know that they've got other albums before this, but this is the first one. And this, is, this has got the banger right here. This has got a live banger. This is Christians to the Lions. This is As Above, So Below. This is from the Zos 
Kia Cultus album. jam right here. I remember hearing this for the first time back in 2004, and I was like, oh, shit, listen to that riff. It could have been a thrash riff, but they put that spin on it and made it into something else. So heavy. This shit, the song is crushing live, too. off of Demigod. Oh man, there's so many good songs off of that record. Opening track on that record is fucking phenomenal. This is also off of that album. Right here. Shit, fucking brutal. Brutal. Let's go to that. Comes out of the lead and goes into the that hook. Slave Salser. This is at the left hand, oh God. Oh God. OV, you know, they got the OV on everything. This is from the apostasy. Behemoth at this point was like, oh my god, this song is fucking awesome. This right here is 
tell you what, at my gym that I go to, the owner, Ted, Coach Ted, he fucking loves Behemoth, and he plays nothing but death metal, just blasting black metal, death metal, plays Behemoth like crazy, decapitated like crazy, Vader, Morbid Angel, Sepultura, blasts it too, like he fucking blasts the fucking brutalest shit at his gym, and it's awesome to work out to. And this song, man, he plays the shit out of this song. And this is this is a fucking awesome song to do bench press to or squats. It's that tempo, such a catchy riff. So good. I love it. Right here, too. This is the intro. Blow your trumpets, Gabriel. Ladies and gentlemen, right now, I'm bringing to you from the mighty, mighty behemoth, Mr. Adam Nurgle. Dartsky. Nurgle. Dudeski. What's How up? are you, friend? <laughs> I'm okay. How are you, man? Uh, considering uh, circumstances which are kind of weird, um, I'm okay. I mean, we are uh, like, we're like two or three days uh, before a presidential election, and it causes a lot of uh, tension, and people are truly like concerned and worried. Poland is very much divided in two countries now, it seems. I mean, not officially, not legitimately, but, you know, <clears throat> there's half that is very conservative and half that is very um, pro-European Union, uh, very liberal. And uh, I don't need to add that, you know, I... I belong to the latter one, and this there's definitely a clash. I mean, you have that, you know, like the, that. That's how the world is built, pretty much. It's very polarized, you know. You've always had that in U.S., right? It's Republicans, Democrats. It's always that two angles, two uh, poles that you know that uh, kind of clash with each other. So we have that in Poland now, and it's uh, yeah, it's it's quite stressful. Yeah. I think it's a lot of, um, at least from my, and I, and I admittedly limited understanding of what's going on in, in Poland, but it is a lot to do with religion, right? Like a lot of it's like the hard conservatives are very religious, right? Yeah, it's, uh, the thing is that Poland, um, it's always been very, I mean, the conservatives, it's like they are glued to a Catholic tradition and it's never been separate. So uh, the alternative for the, for the present president, we have the guy that's very forward thinking and like one of his um, main postulates is to divide church from the state, which is to me, in, in my opinion, in order to evolve, in order to... Uh, finally become a civilized country you cannot have these two um, offices or whatever you call it these two elements glued together you know what i mean church should it must be separate it must be uh separately taxed uh by the way it i think it should like in, in the end of the day it should be donated and taxed only by its supporters and believers because as for now, I'm, I'm like, I'm earning enough. I mean, I'm earning a uh, decent money and of course I'm paying decent taxes, but like a big chunk of those taxes is supporting agendas that I'm officially anti, you know what I mean? So to me, yeah. it, it's catch 22. It's a paradox. I don't want to be a part of that. I, I don't want to have anything with that, you know, just take my money to support universities, schools, um, uh, orphans, uh, you know what I'm talking about? Just, roads, just yeah, 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 just roads, just things that needs to be fixed, needs to uh, needs uh, a support and help, and not church. 
Yeah. And so on, Does, so on. In, yeah. Amer- in America, in America, the church doesn't pay any tax. Is that the same over there? Uh, I guess so. I guess so. Yeah. I'm, I'm not really an expert, you know, I'm not really the thing, you know, with the politics is that, uh, I wouldn't like to even to step into these areas, you know, if it was up to me and my needs, I don't want to do that. But when you become an adult and you become, uh, a, you know, a part of a society, you're paying taxes, you're, you're recognized. Uh, you just cannot say no to politics because you are politics. Yeah. Unless you're homeless, this is probably the only truly uh, liberal and 100% free uh, state of, of, you know, of human that, that you can think of these days. It's like if you're homeless and you're attached to nothing, so you can basically say, yeah, fuck the system. But if right. you're paying taxes, you're voting, you are politics. So like yeah. when I get a lot of shit on my internet, on my social media, so like, yeah, deal with music. Stop, you know, taking, st- stop speaking out. I'm like, why? Yeah. Why? I mean, why the, the, I... The, air, the air that you, the air you breathe is politics. The water, <laughs> cle- the cleanliness of the water you drink is politics. You know, like exactly. it's all intertwined. I'd like to say sadly, but that's what it is. So I must learn its tools. I must learn to, uh, to the, you know, to, to learn the basics and, and what this world is based on, you know? Maybe one day I'm gonna just fuck it all and just, you know, move to a, a deserted island and, and then like, yeah, fuck it. Maybe one day. <laughs> right. But for now, I'm here in Sopot or Warsaw and I'm in the middle of that, of that thing. So. I cannot say no to politics. Yeah. I mean, I'm definitely a big advocate of the church paying taxes, like especially here in America. If I got to pay 35%, those motherfuckers got to pay 35%. They're making money hand over fist. So fuck them. You know? Yeah. And there's a big pushback against that. That's a very controversial statement, you know, but to me, that's I what I believe, you know, why shouldn't know. they? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, um... all those, all those fucking evangelical pre- preachers and ministers flying around in private jets and shit. It's like, no, fuck you. If I had known it before, if you had told me that before, I wouldn't be sitting here playing guitar and making music. I'd be one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I want to have a private jet. <laughs> <laughs> right. Just got to get to that U2 status, right? Like that U2 <laughs> band status where you got the private, the multiple private jets. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think we can. Well, I don't think like the bands of our status. I mean, even if we are kind of flirting with mainstream, being um, extreme metal or thrush metal or machine head metal or behemoth metal, whatever, I don't think we can. We will ever get on 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 free jets. But um, I think we're, now we are at the at the status of aspiring to get on the business class <laughs> yes <laughs> right. which would be which would we're, be yeah, which, yeah which we're, would be we're like already, we're you know? stoked as fuck when we're in business class right we're like yes especially for the long flights absolutely that's the way <laughs> yeah i gotta say you are um you posted on your Instagram yesterday, I think it was yesterday or the day before, you posted a, a sex god picture of you with the abs and the bullet belts and the, and the, you know, who wants to fuck when you want, when all I want is love. And I was like, it made me think as a single guy, at least my understanding, but I could be wrong, as a single guy, is it, what are the challenges of getting pussy during the coronavirus era? Is it easier or harder to get pussy? To date, uh, to you know, to meet girls, it, to hook up. Uh, honestly, it, it doesn't really make any difference as long as there's Tinder. So you can always <laughs> play, you can always meet, you know, and like, like, hey, despite coronavirus and like isolation and all the limitations that were forced upon us. I mean, that's what I've learned from all the observation. Of course, we have to wash our hands. We have to watch, you know. I mean, don't get into like, you know, big um, like communities, like, you know, 
clubs and stuff, you, you got to avoid that. But having one-on-one -on -one interaction, either with a friend and drinking beer or having a date at your place or whatever, I mean, the chances are really like pretty much close to zero. So I wouldn't, I've never stressed about that. But uh, so this is a technical answer to your question. And the more metaphysical answer is um, we all need that and fuck can be fun. But in, the end, <laughs> but, hey, but, in, but in the end of the day, I would really, I'm like, like between you and me and now between you and me and um, the no fucking regrets uh, listeners of my podcast. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, yeah, I, I'm kind of, I kind of crave for something, you know, bigger, something bigger than just uh, intercourse, something more meaningful and deeper. I don't know, man. I mean, I, I do crave for that, but, uh, the more I, you know, the more I live and, and, and see what life is all about and, and how difficult it is to maintain a, a solid, decent relationship in the world of opportunities. Ah, it's so, it's crazy. <laughs> and I remember we had that conversation, um, or maybe not exactly that one, but uh, I kind of... I kind of look up to you, you know, because you've been in, in, in the same relationship for, you tell me how many years, how many decades? Yeah. yeah two decades. I'm going to be this July in, a, in next week is our 20th wedding anniversary. Wow. So wedding, yeah. but before do you, yeah. do you, it was, uh, it was, date? yeah, we dated for years before that. It took me a long time to get to marriage. Oh, see, that's what I mean. It's like, and if it works, and if you are, is that, uh, if, if you are really able to maintain that, that's hand, I mean, chapeau bar. It's amazing. And I can't, I'm kind of jealous, you know, when I see people, especially from our business, that have that, it's like, holy shit. On one hand, I'm very jealous because it's the haven, you know, that you have. It's the haven. It's that, that, that safe spot that you can always go back, you know, after tour and, uh, I got that, man. I'm on tour and I love it. And I have my bandmates and I have colleagues and there's girls, you know, here and there. And it's all good. It's all cool. But I kind of miss just calling that person and saying, hey, I had a shitty show or a great show or I miss you. I haven't had that for, for many years now. And uh, it's not that there's, there's on and off, there's girls that I, that I, I date for like months which is already a long mm -hmm. for me, but I kind of lost that. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I lost something. I lost the passion for, for something that is deeper. I don't know, man. It, it just it's a lot of work, man. It's a lot of work. You know, it's, it's a lot of arguing. It's a lot of, you know, working things out. It's a lot of compromise. It's, you know, the, the, the D word has been thrown around a lot wow. over those 20 years, but you know, like you just, and I don't, and, and I don't know really why it worked out. Like we just continue to make it work. I would give her more of the credit than me because she's the one who's alone at home while I'm gallivanting around the world and playing shows and getting drunk and, you know, so it's a, it's an interesting life, you know, and, and, and it's funny because I look at you sometimes and I'm just like, wow, like this fucking single guy, he's in a super popular band. Like he's got to be fucking living the life. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> pussy fucking left, right and center. You know, <laughs> I mean, you own a club, you own a club. We hung out at your club that one night yeah. when we yeah. were, when we were in Danks. And, uh, I remember you had the confessional, you've got your confessional, the coke professional. <laughs> <laughs> You, just, you were just uh, you were just taking like the hottest girls in there and just and I was just like look at this motherfucker just killing it I was like this is fucking amazing yeah coke fashion is uh, you just made up this word you know I'm, <laughs> I it, it should have been me uh, anyways I'm gonna steal it but I'll pay you royal royalties for that <laughs> anyways uh uh yeah. But then again, you know, like, I think the problem that we have these days is, the, is that we are spoiled with, with, the, with the spoils, with the goods around us. And uh, I think that also COVID kind of made me 
um, rethink and revisit and and yeah, just just give give it some like a deeper reflection. You know that I've just been spoiled. Also, like when you mentioned girls, it's just when there's girls, 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 and at at some point you like you don't remember what's her name. It's a problem. You know what I mean? But it's I don't want to make women sound like subjective here because that's the last thing I want to do. I think I, maybe I just got lost uh, somewhere or I'm like, or I'm just spoiled or I'm bored, you know, it's just, so in the end of the day, Oh, there's a pussy, you know, but it sounds, it will sound very old. Now I go like Netflix book, uh, jerk off and decent sleep. Or a crazy and wine and 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 fresh pussy, man. It's a coming out for me saying that now. On more and more occasions, I'll just go for the first one. Right. Just right. give me some space. Give me some private time. I don't really need that. You know, stimulants all the time. I've had a lot of that on tour. There's always people on tour. There's always fans, you know, and as much as I love dealing with people and I love people, I have this ambivalence that just on the other side of that, I'd be like, I try to level it out and I'd be like, you know right. what? I'd rather stay home and be boring. And I must admit that I love that life. So yeah. when a lot of people out there are complaining about the situation because it's complainable. I mean, we're not earning much money because we're not touring. There's techs that are, are uh, workless. Uh, they have no money. They have no money saved for later. So it, it becomes not just my problem. It becomes problem of my band, of a company that band oh. is at the end of the day. So it's, it makes, it, 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 it may, you know, may depress you or it may just make you feel bad for you know, for them and just, you know, for the whole crisis that is happening, that is escalating, that is progressing because it ain't over. Probably the worst is to come. We kind of overcome the first wave of that. Now it's, it's summer, so we're kind of dealing with that. We don't really spend that much time in the internet reading the news and statistics that are brutal. Uh, but... Uh, I'm a fan of the situation of the isolation. And uh, I don't know if you had that thoughts, you know, because you are heavy, heavily, heavily touring artists, same like me. And at some point you're not even asking yourself, oh, should I skip the season or festival season? You're not doing festival seasons, but if you don't, then you tour. And, uh, I wouldn't take the responsibility on my on myself and say, "Hey, to all the tax, to my bandmates having fucking mortgages and loans and this and that and managers are like guys, uh, one year off. We're not doing anything. What do you mean? Yeah, I just need to be on my own to fucking to breathe, to meditate." to read books and to right. maybe think about the reefs. Right. Don't I mean, rush my never, reefs. Think about that me. never comes you know into I mean? it. Yeah, that never comes into it, right? Never. <laughs> like, it's just go, so, go, 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 go. Exactly. Once you get into this uh, wild, crazy, hectic cycle, you just you, you just go with it, you know, because you know that there's a, you know, a thing called, a definition called momentum. And you, you with Machine Head, you've had numerous momentums. And we now with Behemoth, we know that we have our momentum. So you got to push. You cannot just say, okay, let's take a break two years. Because maybe in two years down the road, there's nothing waiting for you. Because this business is a monkey business. People, like everything is temporary these days. You're on the top or like aspiring band. You're climbing, climbing up, you know, and you see that fucking 8,000 uh, meters peak there. You don't stop. You don't take a break. You fucking go. You might die on the way, but you cannot just give up and say, oh, I need to take a breath. No. It, it, this business, as any other business, is boom, boom, pushing very hard, working hard. Otherwise, it's, you know, bands are just going to drop. And you know it, and I know it now. 
So this is maybe the only time in history of music or like any kind of entertainment that the universe said on hold, everyone, pause, pause, stay home. And you know what? Trust me, I came off this sleep note tour right like one week before the shit hit the fan and everything was just shut down. And I had like three weeks off and then I, I would start promoting me and that man and then follow with the tour. And then when I kind of sense that it's not happening, I was so happy. Oh. <laughs> And I couldn't really say it loud. I can tell, like the look on your face right now is pure. Like I'm serious. Like when he says, "I'm so happy," <laughs> like there is genuine joy on your face. I I felt bad for my bandmates who are super hungry. Yeah, we're like yeah, we're touring and and they are very hungry for that, you know. But I've I've been doing this for decades now. Every year, bang bang, more more more, bigger bigger. And yes, I love it. It's very addictive. And I want to do it. I want to go back on tour. But uh, for now, what it is, it's fucking amazing. Yeah. I mean, Just, and it, it, you're right. I mean, there's so many, there's so many, like it's, it's a giant reset button and it's just such a, you know, you don't, you don't think that you need it. You don't even realize it. You're, you know, you're uh, exactly what you said. Like you're just going because, like, that's what you know. It's like the blinders are on. Yeah. Just get. To, you know, you're just. I, I'm gonna finish this, and then I'm gonna go to the next one, and then you never stop and assess your mental health. You never stop and assess your. You know, like. I, yeah. I think that it really is a great time to just step back and go, "Wow, fucking." You know, maybe look back at the things you accomplished. You know, because Behemoth, compl I mean, especially the last, you know, the Slipknot tour and fuck, I mean, this like killing it, like on a fucking huge thing. And, and, you know, maybe examine if you could have done something better, if you did, maybe you could have done something a different way, you know, contemplate those things. Like, you know, I, I think that especially being in a band and being a creative like you are, you know, and, you know, maybe, th maybe this is true, but like how you, like, you kind of constantly have to like evaluate and then just move forward and not look back. You know what I mean? Like, and just kind of go like, that's cool. I did that. I got to go someplace else. And I don't know where that is. Yeah. So I, I totally agree. And uh, like, for example, um, I'm 43 this year. So uh, uh, even 15 years ago, I wouldn't use all these devices like iPhone and record ideas. I wouldn't really do much of that, you know. Maybe not 15, but 20 years ago and before, due to the fact that, first of all, my memory was way fresher than it is today. It was way uh, less processed and used uh, than it is today. I don't know about yourself, but I would remake the whole record and I would grab the guitar and just play it off the hat, you know, just without even thinking twice about it, okay? That's how I would, I would make records. I wouldn't you would, even- You would memorize it. You'd memorize it. I would memorize it. every single detail. Left guitar, uh, would hum the, the right guitar, okay. This, blah, 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 blah. I wouldn't need to like put anything on any tape or like any device because all was here. So, you know, you do more and more, you collect all this data in your brain, your brain is fucking bursting out, exploding, you know, and you're losing memory, you need to make notes, that's what I do, you need to make notes on everything, otherwise you're gonna lose it, and you don't wanna lose it because you being an artist is like having a radar here, you know, it's a radar, and you're like, there's an idea or there's like a reef or there's a, a, a name for a song or whatever. Boom, you have to put it down. Back then, I would just hum it. Oh, cool. One week later, I would still remember that. So guess what? For the first time in, I don't know, in ages, I would just grab my guitar. I would just jam something and I would think about it and I would just lay on my sofa 
and and look in the like in the roof and and contemplate and then oh i'm going to go back to the reef tomorrow and then i go back to the reef tomorrow and and there's no deadline and there is nothing because there was nothing you know it's like there's probably no shows happening this this year we want to do the record you know but i had everything planned in my calendar but since corona happened we're like you know what everyone just do your things you know and i would just sit at home for weeks and then months just putting songs together with no stress with no oh there's a rehearsal i need to bring some idea out to the rehearsal and i've been there like for i don't know 20 years now oh there's a rehearsal so i had to kind of force myself to sit on my ass and come up with something and then we just go and and do the songs song like or a part of the song a chunk of the song and uh ah, it's it's good it's solid you know and then boom it goes to the studio and now we make one demo and then the second demo first one with the drum machine then inferno would just do his own like a uh, you oh, know okay manual programming and then we have like are you doing it are you doing it to a click like you're recording it to a click and then sending it to him yes yeah, yeah, yeah. But then, you know, he just uses his uh, fingers. Like, so he manually puts it, uh, like replicates the drum machine and just mm -hmm. plays with his fingers the way he plays you know, real drums, yep. which is less, you know, uh, robotic, so to say. So it's, it, 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 it's kind of cool. Then we put the songs together and then we started rehearsing, like, what, two or three weeks ago. We completely, like, re... Uh, like rebuild our rehearsal place. So now it's more of a studio. We bought like a professional uh, uh, mixing board and like nice system. Everything is just, and now we're playing, you know, and we get this quality of, of rehearsing that we've never had in our lives. That's and right. We're just sitting there. We can hear every single note. And then we are playing, basically replicating the demos that were quite detailed. Like not fully finished because there's like, yeah. you no, know, when we get in the room, we always, we can always question ideas. We can always like remove like parts and just whatever, fuck around with this. Right. But mm -hmm. so much comfort and, uh, and still there's months. I don't know how many months we probably plan start uh, tracking drums in November. So it gives us another, what, like, over three months, months of yes. rehearsals and no stress and no, uh, just just the room. You know what I mean? So like we did like a couple of shows and rehearsals. Okay, fuck off for two weeks. And then I go home and I have whole days that I don't need to, they have no meetings, nothing. It's just quiet. And I'm like, oh, do I feel like, contemplating that song and that idea today, ah, maybe tomorrow. You know what I mean? It's the, finally, yeah. there's a space in life. And I, I, I don't, I've never had that in, in like 15 or 20 years now. So it is happening. So I'm, I'll, I'll try to wrap it up now because I know that the, the, my thought is very long now. No, but anyways, no, how, goes how, on many people, how many people around you have that, always bitch about like oh, I don't have time to spend you know uh, to you know to play with my kids to take my lady for dinner to do this to do that and I'm like you know what now you have all the time in the world totally. to do that and now these people bitch about holy shit I'm not gonna stand one day longer with this kid <laughs> I'm not gonna stay one day longer with that bitch right. I, I got enough of the dog of this of that like hey why are you complaining? You've always prayed right. for that. Like you were constantly on tour or something. So what's wrong now? You know, you guys or whoever is watching this, you got the time. If you ever complain that you don't have time to read a book, now is the time to read, read at least 20 books within that period or anything. If you hadn't, right, totally. hadn't, had, hadn't had that time before, this is the time to do it. If there's, or fucking fucked up lamp or uh, a, a window in your house, you know, that couldn't be fixed for 10 years. 
right. this is the day, this is the time to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. I genuinely do. I, I told myself at the beginning of the pandemic, I had my freak out. You know, I think everybody had the kind of freak out. We had to cancel our tour. So it was just like, oh, my God, like, what the fuck? And then once it settled in, I was like, I'm going to take this time and I'm going to dedicate one hour every day to bettering myself somehow. I'm going to read a book that I've been, you know, maybe self-improvement book, or I'm going to just, you know, kick my workout game up, you know, like, I mean, all the gyms are closed in California. So I'm just like, I'm fucking carrying tires and I'm dragging rocks. And I'm like, you know, we ended up buying some like weight set up. And so now yeah, I, like, and literally, I, I have no, I have no fucking excuse now huh? to not do that. And it's like six days, seven days a week, I'm fucking grinding. And I'm like, feel stronger i feel so much better like i'm you know just having your mental you know you, you feel your mind getting stronger doing that shit i'm like it's not that bad you know there's there's bad things about it sure but there's you know if you can apply yourself there's a fucking lot of good things to it too man absolutely i mean i i totally agree with that that uh, people could use that time that's what i told myself before when it's over, we still don't know if it's over or when it's over or whatever. It, uh, when it like just relax, relaxes, just gets gets like calmer. I wanna come out more relaxed, stronger, better shaped, uh, with a you know with a clear and uh, and and passionate and hungry mind. I don't wanna end up this season this COVID season, whatever we call it, fat, depressed. No, drunk. right? No, 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 no. You, you use that. You, you use that coin for a better, just, just to improve yourself, to, to elevate yourself. You can do it in so many ways. So, um, yeah, I mean, and that's, that's what I did. You know, it, it wasn't anything drastic. It wasn't anything uh, extreme. I just well, I'm going to improve this. I'm going to improve that. So basically it's the same person and it just, Hey, but you know, you can, you can be a little bit stronger, a little bit, bit smarter too. You know what I mean? Because you can read more than usually, you know, you have, you know, for sure. Yeah. So, and, and you can always add like a little break here and there, you know, to, to build that uh, wall or build a house or whatever metaphor we come up here with and just, to, to be a little better person, you know? So, yeah, I think, I think I did okay job and I watched your, uh, uh, videos from the, from the garage because that's where you work out, right? In the garage. Right. right yeah. so, so like I always, I mean, I always support that kind of, uh, spirits and motivation and I, and I get response, you know, like when I, whenever I'm in the gym, like not every time, but I'm like, I feel like, I want to share this with the, with the universe, you know, because I know it resonates and it's not really, Hey, look, uh, my, my biceps. No, I mean, my biceps is very medium. It's very, I mean, I'm not a big guy and I'm not aiming to a big muscle guy, but I want to be fit. You know what I mean? So for me, it's like, I want to be fit. I want to be well read. I want to be well educated. I want to be uh, ever curious. I want to be open-minded and uh, if I can make posts about it, if I can share it with the universe, the, the, the social media universe that is watching, that might inspire some people out there. And I know it does. And it's yeah. not really about uh, some people like may accuse you or and I get that shit every now and then like, Oh, it's all about you, you, you. Yeah, but it's it's my Instagram, not yours. So why right. I should? You know what I mean? It's me. Right. You don't you don't need to do what I do, but you know I yeah. get that. You know, people see. Oh, this is shit. what I'm doing. This is what I'm doing. This is my life, and you can yeah, do whatever is... the fuck you want. You can just unfollow. You don't need to comment. <laughs> I but know, right? <laughs> that's, that's so easy. But still, people are like following to, to talk <laughs> some negativity. Why you're wasting your precious life on something negative? Don't do that. Totally. 
exactly like just you don't want just mute me unfollow me i don't care go look at whoever else you want to look at (laughs) no one asked you to follow you know i didn't ask you to follow me exactly i i mean like so if i get people that look up to me or like whatever i post a yoga uh, asana um, uh, position or whatever and like numerous comments are like holy shit i gotta go to the gym okay thanks you know what I mean? It's like, nice. I kicked someone's ass, you know, and, yes. and it wasn't really my intention, but like my intention is like, Hey, this is part of my life and I enjoy it. And then someone thinks like, Holy shit, you know, he makes me work out or he makes me make that effort. And that is very normal. It's, I think that's, that's the word for that sport called Stafet. Stafet, that's the name for that. In Polish it's Stafeta. I think German must be Stafet when you are uh, passing the, the stick. Oh, right, right, yeah. Mm-hmm. So whoever is there watching me, just keep in mind that I'm watching somebody. Yeah, totally. And I'm watching somebody and I'm like... And getting, in, and getting inspired, you know? It, like you're I mean, maybe, maybe, you're la- maybe you're feeling lazy one day and you watch me exactly. doing bench press. You're like, yeah, fuck that. I got to go do something. I got to get out there, yeah, you know? That's what I do. That's, that's the content that I'm looking for in the internet you know i watch a documentary on i don't know jack white making a song like man 99 percent you'll see nurgle just grabbing a guitar like i not that i can do better but i want to challenge myself i can write a song too you know what i mean not just to match up with jack white or whoever uh, artist that i'm following or watching but I need that inspiration because I feed on that content. And to me, it feels natural that if I feed on somebody's passion or whatever, there's people that might get it from me, you know, because I don't want to accumulate all that energy here because I'm going to fucking burst out otherwise. So it's like, you got to take and just pass it on. Boom. It should go there because maybe someone needs that. That's how I see that. You know, and uh, yeah, I don't know why we started talking about it, but it's positive. So why not? Yeah, I got to say, I got to say, of all the metal people I follow, you are definitely, first of all, you're, cr- I, I've done yoga for 20 years on and off and oh. you're, cr- you crush it. <laughs> like You are oh, fucking really? crushing yoga. Yeah. Right. Like I am nowhere. You're doing poses that I've been doing for 20 years and still can't fucking even oh. pull off. And so it's rad to watch you and, and to see it because you don't see it. In, in fact, it, in a lot of ways, I, I looked at myself because I never showed any video or any uh, pictures of me doing the yoga stuff because I was like, uh, people are going to go, uh, fucking what the fuck, dude. And, <laughs> and, 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 you know, and then I had seen you do it and I was just like, look at this. I was like, that's fucking rad. You know, like it's rad that you did that because I think it is cool to like, it's fucking hard. It's yeah. fucking a challenge it's so much more of a challenge than i think most men in particular real and certainly metal dudes realize and you know i think it's awesome that you continue to put it out there and you know watched your progress which is pretty amazing like you're i mean you're just now you're flexing you did something like you pulled your arm back like jesus christ i can't do that <laughs> but it's it's killer i mean i mean and then i think the thing that no jesus christ <laughs> <laughs> I think the thing that's I awesome you're, you're to you're uh, talking the Jesus Christ Asana, right? The Jesus Christ Asana. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't want to go there. The uh, the the mental aspects, though, was something that I took a long time to really appreciate about it. That there is so much of that concentration on a single thing, blocking out outside noises and people coughing and kids ringing on the, you know, the wall of the gym. And, you know, I mean, how, how is that? Do you find that too? Like, do you really enjoy that mental aspect of it? Very much so. And uh, I must say that at this stage, I'm, I'm still new to yoga, which is, I don't know how long I've, I've done that. Two years now or three years. So it's, I'm still fresh and still, uh, and nail fit or neophyte or whatever you pronounce it like, but, um, my body and my um, spirits crave for that. 
So I might be somewhere or like my yoga teacher, I mean, she's my neighbor, so I can just literally walk to her studio and do yoga. But for example, now she is in a different city. So probably like in two or three days, you know, I'll be just calling her and then we'll do online session. So whenever okay. I'm somewhere on tour, I just, and I feel like, holy shit, ah, I need that. And my body just, you need to do yoga session. Don't, don't, no more weights or no more jogging or this or that. You need yoga. And I remember feeling like maybe even a year ago, it felt like competition to, let's say, weights. So I'd be like, eh, weights are better. Weights are more like masculine, like manly stuff, you know, like yoga is kind of, eh. but now not anymore because first of all, I don't need to pretend and just play um, a macho here. You know what I mean? I just, I'm just telling you that, you know what? I don't feel like, you know, lifting weights today, but I do feel like fucking stretching, you know, because my body needs that. And maybe when you're 25, you'll, you'll be hiding facts that you're doing yoga because you maybe feel ashamed, you know, in front of your masculine, like bodybuilders or whatever. And I know that heavy metal, I mean, uh, the heavy metal community is opening up, okay? They're getting yes. more and more liberal and just more tolerant, which is, which is obviously is very cool. And... Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, I have no problems with just sharing that, um, uh, that side of, you know, my workout routine with the world. But the cool thing about that is that, your, for example, Johan from Amonomot, which is a very, you know, two-tonic. Manly. Death, yeah, manly. manly Viking, thing. yes. Him and his wife, you know, on Instagram doing yoga. I think it, this oh, yeah? is amazing. Oh, I got to see that. This is amazing. <laughs> That's right. And it's like... And it, he's the nicest guy. He's the he's, nicest guy, though. He's super down to earth and, and super nice. And then he's fucking, he's like a bear, right? He's huge. Yeah. He looks like, you know, he wouldn't give a fuck about like this nuances of yoga or whatever. No, it's quite an opposite. And, uh, and that is amazing. And I think it's like guys like, I hope that guys like myself or Johan just doing that we can be that gateway thing for some of the metal heads. And I get, I got that, you know, there was a guy who approached me at the gym like two weeks ago. And he's like, I remember thinking yoga is oh, now I shouldn't say that, but I will. It's like a gay thing. Right. And I'm like, well, I mean, people it's, it's stereotyped that it's like, it's, it's like for females, for girls, whatever, but it's a stereotype. And then he's confessing. And then I tried it and man, you are so right, you know, and, and now I just cannot live without it. You know, of course I do weights and I do this and boxing and stuff, but I do yoga because what, what yoga does to me, first of all, it just, it just get, gets my mm, um, mindset in the right balance. And it's, and yoga is not just about, body it's it's very holistic exercise that just works on so many levels and yes it's it does miracles we don't believe in the bullshit but when you live stressful life when you when you're using your muscles so much you know like myself uh just you know straining yourself just you know using yourself and and you using your brain too Getting to that yoga thing once, twice a week, it's like a bliss, really. And uh, I'm a very ADHD person. I'm all over the place and I can easily get distracted because that's, you know, with all the tools that we have, all the social media and stuff, which are cool, but are, uh, simultaneously they're also very uncool because they take away a lot of attention that we could focus on something way more creative. Getting the balance that is here and in your body. And, and it's, it's very important not to just to stay sane. And uh, I really hope that a, a regular yoga practice eventually is going to lead me to 
a proper meditation. Because that is something that I know that at some point I will start doing. I mean, there's no escape, you know, I will. It's just a matter of time. It might be a year or two years, but yoga is my, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's a step towards that direction. Do you, do you meditate? Like, do you actively meditate? No, I, I had some episodes in my life that I really, uh, that I learned some primitive practice, practices of like how to meditate just to calm down and, you know, bring some tranquility in my, in myself, in my environment. And, um, yeah, it's, I mean, I'm not going to go into details, but it was like my mental problems and the heartbreaks and all that stuff, you know, and just, so yeah, I would do it every now and then and just light a candle and, you know, breathing techniques and trying to focus and trying not to distract your brain and just, you know, be present it's very challenging and extremely difficult. <laughs> it's like one of the, uh, and, and because by nature, I'm a thinker. Right. I have a tendency to overanalyze and there's just, it's, it's, yes. it's my brain is burning all the time. It's just always thinking ideas, stuff, always. Right. And I think, you know, like so everyone, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just it's it's a constant stream of thoughts, and uh, I I would say that you know, gross of them are useless. <laughs> and of course, you know, I mean, like, why would I think about this or that? You know, I mean, like, I catch myself in thinking about stuff that is useless. I mean, why would I spend my time and energy thinking about someone? Or about the conflict that maybe there's just happening here. You know what I mean? Right. Oh my God. I can I can I can have an argument with somebody in my head. I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? This is fucking insane here. Like that is so me. That is so me. And then, you know, because I had like I I uh, I had a coach, you know, and I I had like few therapy sessions that I never finished, you know, because I always go on tour and then it's kind of you know stops. But uh Man, it is so me. I can, I can go jogging and I can have this conversation, this dialogues just happening in my head, you know. And then I'm like, oh shit! When I'm gonna meet that guy, I'm gonna fucking tell him right. straight right. up what I think about. And then you meet <laughs> that person, and the guy goes like, hello, and you know that he's <laughs> absolutely on a different planet. You just right. making it up in your fucked up head. Right. That's what it is. <laughs> so true. That is <laughs> so like, true. and then you go like, hmm, why? Why would I? Would I even do that? But then again, uh, I'm not trying to like, you know, excuse myself. But um, you write pretty angry music, and I'm write pretty angry music. So don't you think that sometimes we kind of we kind of provoke that kind of situations or we need that internal dialogue that just, you know, gets us this tension and gets us going because we need some of that inspiration. Don't you think so? I, th I think, I think most, you know, like most musicians are very, or artists are very emotional by nature. They're affected heavily by the things around them or that they see in the world yeah. and that somehow for whatever reason we can challenge we can channel that into yeah. a lyric or a song or a hook or a riff or a whatever that you know people connect with somehow and i don't know why you know like it's just that i but i but i've noticed that you know and i think that it is a good thing you know it it's a it's a sensitivity to things and sometimes that sensitivity can be too much. And sometimes it's, you know, what the situation needs and is right for the situation, you know, mm -hmm. like you're affected by it. You mm -hmm. know, I think Keith, Keith Richards has that famous you know, quote where he says, you know, we're just a vessel. We're just channeling what's going through us. And it's so true. Like we are just, we're absorbing these things and then just pushing them back out through our lens, your lens, my lens, 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, so uh, when we were talking about meditation and, uh, you know, I mean, uh, so the absolute uh, kind of uh, the goal is to get this Zen mode, right? And yeah, that's what, why we are meditating. That's why we're doing yoga because we need this peace. But then the question is, would I like to like get this permanent Zen status? I don't think so. You know, like maybe some monks can do that, have this ability right. to do that. But now, I'm what I'm why the reason why I'm practicing is just to stay sane and just you know just be healthy mentally and and physically but i wouldn't like to be like completely immune to the environment and just get this mm, um, yeah i yeah. love everyone do i want to be that guy yeah uh, I, I that's something i re- i totally agree that's something i wrestle with you know and even to some degree i mean i'm sure your fans say it to you you know like a lot of people will ask me to write like burn my eyes again and i'm like look i'm not a 23 year old sexed up drug dealer who's getting in fights every weekend and you know one step away from fucking homelessness like i i i can't ever go back there you know like i like i'm just not that you know it would be super phony for me Mm -hmm. to try and try and write from that headspace because i'm not there i just gotta write from where I am because life moves on, you evolve, things change in your life, you know, like, and, but, but it's like, you know, there's that part of you that romanticizes that. Like I go, oh, I want to, you know, like I was like, I look back and I'm like, fuck, I was so fucking angry. Like I was just the fucking angry. I was just a fucking bomb ready to explode. Like I would fight somebody at the drop of a hat, you know, like I would just, it was, and it's like, there's part of me that romanticizes it a little bit. And then yeah. there's the part of me that's, you know, comfortable in my skin now and goes, yes, that was part of my life. And I'll never change that part of my life. And I'll never be ashamed of that part of my life. But I'm not going to glorify that part of my life and say that what I am now isn't good because it is, you know, like it's good for, you know, it's what I needed in my life to get to here. You know, if I would have kept on the same road, I probably would have been dead. You know, like there was so, so many times when, you know, I got in a gang fight with like 15 dudes and like people were getting stabbed and fucking, you know, it was like, it sh- I could have died at any fucking minute. And to not be in that place anymore is healthy and good. And you know, so it is this weird, I know what you're saying when it's like, there's that, that balance of, yeah. of what, you know, what you become as an artist and what you, and, or, and what people perceive you as. Yeah. Yeah. You're, perce- you're perceived as a certain behemoth. Nurgle from behemoth is perceived as a certain thing, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then again, you know, I'm just too old, uh, read too mature to, still stupid, <laughs> but mature enough to not to pretend. And uh, I get, like, that's what I decided to do. I don't know when, I don't remember the, exactly the the. Um, the situation but like I just want to be myself you know I just don't want to like put mask like all the time or like oh shit in order to keep all the following and fans and whatever mystery I'm not gonna do this or I'm not gonna do that no I mean like there is more to me than just a stage persona yes and I just don't want to limit my life or just be a slave to that stage persona that I created uh, the stage persona is still me. It's um, the beast on stage is still me. And I got like every now and then I got that uh, I confront people from um, it's like the regulars. Okay. They just approach me like, Oh, look, he's, he's laughing. He's smiling. He's not fucking spitting, you know, blood and, 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 fire and brimstone and and you know it's just oh are the horns there you know what i mean it's like like seriously i mean i'm a human being just regular human being with ups and downs i love laughing i love good laugh um 
and um, and I don't want to hide it. I mean, um, that's why, like, when people, if people follow me on social media, but okay, we're talking social media for like outsiders, but people who know me, I'm a fucking yeah. joker, and I love it, right. and I love just 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 living my life and just being vital, and uh, yeah. So this is, and there's several you know, lives that I'm living and there's a joker, there's a serious person and there's a, there's a political side of me, um, mm-hmm. wanted or, or not. Uh, there's a musician, there's a lover, there's a son of my mom, you know what I mean? And, and, right. and, and I'm a colleague and I'm a friend and in each of the situations, I'm probably, I'm quite positive about it. I'm I'm very different, so I'm differently talking to you now. And I'm uh, when I call my mom or see her tomorrow, I won't talk like that, and so on and so on. And it's all me. So you, one can say that like, okay, I'm wearing a mask talking to you now. In a way, I do, but then when I talk to my mom, I'm wearing a mask of me talking to my mom, or whatever definition mm-hmm. we're gonna put on that interaction right? right but i right. just decided years ago i just decided to like okay if it's gonna ruin some mystery for some i don't know black metal kiddos there or whatever uh, deal with it deal with it because i am who i am and i'm just i just want to live my life and uh i want to share stuff that i think it's worth sharing and then i'm on stage and it it's i mean Nurgle doing yoga, I don't want this to take away anything from that guy that you see on stage because it's also 100% me. It's just a different state of mind. Same like, you know, then you're, I don't know, maybe having, you know, making love to uh, your, you know, your partner and it's also you or it's also me. You know what I mean? It's like, we are so multi-layered. We are so complex creatures that like, in, and, and then we live in a world in, especially these days that all it needs is fucking headlines. Oh, a black metaler, huh? Pedophile. Oh, fascist. You know, we got that fucking every day. People just need labels to put on your boom, boom. Okay. That's it. No discussion needed, you know, because you are this, because you did that. You're wearing a bosom shirt. You must be a fascist. Yeah, but I'm not. I'm actually quite fucking lefty, you know, as a matter of fact, you know. So fuck off. But then again, there's a people who need that very simple description because they don't want to discuss with you anything. They're, they're not going to dig any deeper than the headline that they will get. And that is very disturbing. That is something that I'm not willing to... Uh, comfort and i'm not gonna bend to that and i've been in a very delicate very dangerous situations you know when people trying to accuse me of something that i'm not but um all i can say is like well i'm not this and i'm not that and i'm pretty transparent of what i am on who i support who i don't support and if you cannot put that and make a picture of of who I am, that is your problem. Yeah, so basically, like, I, I made, like, my, you know, it's the political correctness these days that is kind of killing, you know, the spirit and just it's just going way over the board and it's just becoming so dangerous, you know? You know, you know what I wanted to talk to you about? Um, take me back to, take me back to when you were, like, a kid. You know, I'm trying to like, you know, your, your family is, I'm assuming Catholic, like most of Poland. Is it still, is the, is the, is it still considered the Eastern Bloc at this point? Or is it, you know, starting like democracy starting to come? Yeah, I was born in 77. Um, Poland became democratic, democratic. The communist communism fell in 89 in June. Okay. Right. So I was what? Uh, I'm so 15, bad with 15. math. Like, no, no, I was 13. Oh, 12, 13. 12, yeah. Yeah, right, 12 right. 13, okay. yeah. So uh, I'm a kid and I grew up in communism. 
it was kind of uh, it was kind of melting down and just getting like uh, okay, not super radical. So let's say when I was eight or nine, I, I, it it didn't really feel like we are very much um, like restricted or um, you know I couldn't really feel any pressure. I was a kid, you know. I just wanted to play, right. you know, with my toys. Were you doing sports? Yeah, sport. Were you doing sports was, or no? Yeah, yeah. I was doing sports and uh, I was playing guitar. like soccer. No, actually, honestly, I hated soccer from day one. <laughs> wow, you're the first I, European person I've ever met that hated soccer. Wow, and nice. I still do, and I still do, and I'm such a. Uh, now it's just I kind of make fun of it, you know. But uh, I publicly admit it. I fucking hate soccer, and I'm a soccer basher. <laughs> and uh, now, of course, I'm exaggerating now, but I know how many people right, right, are right. pissed off when I say that, so I keep on saying that. Right, right. Uh, this, this <laughs> As nothing should. better than you know poking and uh, <laughs> but yeah, honestly, I just like I remember I would just use I would just do um, I would do judo. My father would take me to oh, judo. Nice. Yeah, when I was eight or nine, and um, I was doing. Right. I, did, I did. I did judo also when I was that age, like really? third, third, fourth grade. Yeah, I think it's it. amazing. I really. I used to love it. And then I just moved on with some other martial arts and uh, I would do like, do like, you know, do martial arts and play guitar. So that was my things. <clears throat> wow. You were playing guitar that early, huh? Yeah. yeah. I got my first guitar uh, for my first communion. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's, that's, uh, uh, and the rest is history. And the rest is history. I mean, like and I didn't get a guitar. The next like, I writing like songs funny. against your communion <laughs> at age eight. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, mom. Sorry, dad. No, I mean, like, uh, you know, this is pretty much like, well, when every kid, if you're not coming from a wealthy family, uh, but an average family like myself, uh, and your pocket money is only that much, you know, so the first... Like, is your family musical? Is your family, is anybody in your family musical? No, no, no. No, 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 like no, no traditions whatsoever. Uh, I got that bug from my brother who brought some, you know, of the Western music uh, home and he brought the guitar and he brought a friend who would play guitar like he was a great blues player. So whenever I saw guitar, I would just, I mean, I, did, I was a kid, so I wouldn't know what, what orgasm is, but I guess my fir first orgasm would be to just to see guitar and I would make trips uh, with a train, or like a 20-minute trip with a train. I couldn't afford shit because I was just a kid, you know, but I'd just go to the music store. It was still communism. We had, there was the private sector, okay? The private sector was pretty much non-existent. So there were some okay. stores and shops, you know, that were private, but there were very few, but especially not the music stores. So everything was national. That's what communism is all about, right? We're all sharing everything and it's all navigated, you know, operated by, by the government. And it's owned by the government. So there was just all this shitty, you know, equipment from the Eastern Bloc, you know. But I remember as a kid, I would just go there and stand for one hour in front of the, you know, exposition. Just... One day, one day I'm gonna I, I I can afford this. One day I'm gonna buy this and I'm gonna start a band. And I would just feed on that dream and that um, fantasy. And uh, yeah, when I finally got my first guitar, I started a band. You know, with my electric guitar would be the only uh, professional instrument in the band. And then the rest got, well, the guys were just, okay, you got the fucking uh, a chair and you just smash the chair and it's going to be right, a snare right. drum. I guess that each one of us did that. I don't know about you. Yes. I mean, like, US, you have access to stuff, you know? I mean, it's always been there, you know? Your musical traditions in USA are, you know, are, are vast. And, and it's, it's, um, it's everywhere. It's always been there. <clears throat> and I always, 
underline that fact that Polish musicians in the 70s and 80s, we really had to struggle to get um, our instruments. And uh, hardly anyone, any of us had money. And uh, parents, I mean, my, I, I still do have both uh, parents, living parents. They were very loving um, people. Not perfect, but they would, of course, you know, they would like to, you know, to make, you know, her, their son happy. So they would help me out to do stuff, okay? And I remember my father could work in a shipyard. So he had connections with all these, you know, blacksmith guys and like guys that would just fix stuff, right? So what mm -hmm. I would do, man, <laughs> that's funny. I would try to explain that. So in a, in a trash, I would just uh, find like this, um, um, mm, it's for laundry, like a, uh, like a steel construction for laundry. Yes, okay? yes, right, right. And I would just bring it home and I would buy at the store, like the music store, I'd buy a very cheap uh, toms, mm -hmm. like, but like a, a kid's one, okay? And I asked my father to take it, to, to, to his work and attach all those toms all over this, this uh, construction. And he would even uh, make a, a, a symbol for me. They would make it with one oh, of wow. his friends, a symbol. And uh, because I would always carry a, a, a home case with me. So how to get a hi-hat from a symbol? You would just put the keys on, a, on that symbol to oh, make okay. it if effect, right. okay? The high, right. the high head effect. Yes, Insane. yes. Insane. So then I would be like, who was my uh, heavy metal body um, in the yard? Oh, Daniel, you'll be the drummer. Me? Yeah, you, come come with me. Just do this. <laughs> so that's how, the, uh, how kids would get their energies out, okay? Because we all were like, exploding with energy so we could just go on for hours rehearsing with without knowing chords notes having no i mean having nothing but imagination and passion yeah and, and uh, i remember i would just record tapes after tapes i would make records making these bands and drawing covers and making songs writing lyrics Wow. Stupid, naive, at the age of sure. 9, 10, 11, I would have bands. One was called Centaur. I would just find a, a tape at my uh, closet, like, lately. Oh, my God. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah I found it. <laughs> that's yeah, amazing. I, that's amazing that you still even have that, dude, that yeah, yeah. nine the years tape, old. That's... Yeah, yeah. And I remember the tape. Uh, there was, uh, it was, ah, uh, no, the tape. This one, I, I think I did when I was 12, maybe. But it says death, uh, Black Death Metal on the tape. And one of the songs is called uh, Necromancer. And I remember nice. that, uh, you know, I mean, I was already into Bathory then. And there was a Necromancy on the first records. I'm like, okay, I mean, and Nigel, get creative, get creative. Necromancy, Necromancer. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> What do you, what do you, and when you're eight and nine years old, what do you, and you're playing guitar, are you listening to like American metal bands or like what, folk, and, like folk music from Poland? Like what is no, the. No, 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 no folk music. We have uh, probably the, 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 the worst folklore ever. It's, it's just not, <laughs> it's, it's, it's no Scandinavia here. It's no, uh, <laughs> it's, 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 it's bad. It's bad. No, no folklore. I would uh, listen to anything I would get on the radio. Um, so in eighties, uh, we had like, I believe two radio stations that once a week they would play, uh, heavy metal for 50 to 60 minutes. Okay. And guess what? That is funny as fuck because of course it was communism. It was, uh, it wasn't attached to the civilized world, you know? So the guy in the radio would just put the whole record and just play start. Boom, the whole record would go. Oh, wow. Crazy. Why? Because they wouldn't give a fuck about publishing. What publishing? We're paying who? Fuck you. Yeah. We are communists. Right. You don't give a fuck. So, yeah, of course, you know, like I 
consider it, uh, uh, you know, they would steal that, okay? <laughs> because they, you know what I mean? It was just bullshit, you know? They, uh, but, I don't but, think that- but because they're stealing it, you're hearing it, which is fucking rad, you know? Like, you're hearing I'm this- I'm yes. thankful for that. So of course, was you know, a, was there like a DJ, like a D, like was it a heavy metal DJ? Like he would kind of. Yeah, I actually, I'm I'm in contact. I'm uh, Facebook Facebook friends with that guy, and uh, awesome. I met him. I met him ages later, and I would tell him, "Man, I owe you so much. Thank you for doing that." And he was like, "That's amazing." He was like, "Holy shit!" Yeah, but he 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 recognized me. He knew me because it was let's say ten years ago. So I was my face was was already uh quite recognized and he was like he was he was stoked he was like holy shit really you serious yeah man i owe you so much so i remember the guy would just say okay so we uh, today we listen he would just you know uh hold the record in the in the studio and uh, i had to wake up 7 10 a.m every sunday oh man and I really? even had the, yeah, yeah, but you know what? Funny thing, you know, because I didn't uh, had, uh, I didn't have an alarm back then. So I had to teach, I remember that I had to teach my body to, um, uh, to Wake set up. alarm, yeah. like the biological alarm, okay? So right. I was so alert every Sunday morning that I would wake up like 10 minutes before, like boom, okay? Like it was so automatic. I would just double check. Okay, everything is working. The tape is ready. Okay, ready, ready, ready. Oh, you'd record it. You'd record yeah, yeah. what he did. Yeah, yes. yeah, I would record the whole album. And uh, I remember, man, you name it, anything, you know, from Sabbath. But then they would just, you know, the like late 80s, there would be, you know, thrash metal scene. And if they would just come up with something that was just regular heavy metal, I was so disappointed because I would just, I would crave for more aggressive music. So I remember... Like Iron, like Iron Maiden? Like was it... No, no, like no, 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 no. I, I, was, I, I was already past Maiden, okay? I was like, oh. Maiden was already, you know, yeah. I mean, I would okay. be a fan of Maiden, but I wanted... And I remember there was like several stuff like that, you know, but I remember getting... Flotsam and Jetsam records, um, something with decay in the title, but Flotsam and Jetsam, thrash metal. And man, I would, it would just electric. Um, I would just get like uh, electric about that. I would just get like, oh, thrash metal. <laughs> and, and, and it already sounded magical. Thrash metal was like, holy shit, you know, I would just stand and. <laughs> that was it was a big deal i remember yeah i remember i would save my best tapes you know because like let's say tdk was you know the you know good brand that was or, the good stuff yeah yeah basf and fucking sony and if i could afford to buy the tape that it would be safe only for like amazing album that i know holy shit that is a holy grail of thrash or death metal and I remember as if it was today when I saved my TDK uh, tape for Altars of Madness by Morbid Angel. Yes. And uh, then again, you know, I... I, I and he played that on the radio? He played that yes. on the radio? Yeah, the wow. full album when, awesome. it was, we, when it was out, which was what, 90, 89? Now I yeah, don't remember. 89. 89, I think. So I would get that. I was uh, 12. And now I can say that. I'm like, I would get that. I would listen to it. I would just give it like numerous spins. But I wouldn't get that music. But you wouldn't get it? What do you mean? I wouldn't. I, I didn't really dig it. Okay. I, did, I I'm. I really wanted to dig it. I really wanted to understand it, but it was too much to process. Okay. It, right. it was too complicated. It was too technical. The vocals, the growling and everything. It was like, I sense that it's something very special about that album that is super, it's, it's magic there, but maybe I'm not ready yet. So I wouldn't delete it. I would just keep it until I'll get mature enough to understand what death metal is all about. 
You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. it's it. I feel it's weird, you know. But uh, that's that's how I treat it. There, like holy shit, ah. Uh, so I get that. I still get that. Okay. Like, uh, let's say, okay, just to give you like very like this simple example. I've always been a Sabbath and Maiden guy, but I've never. I mean, as a kid, I've never been a Deep Purple and Led Zeppelin guy. To me, Deep Purple and Led Zeppelin were like, ah. Eh, not heavy enough to to hit different era, yeah, yeah, different era, and but kind of like both like all four legendary bands. So I would just go for that, you know, for you know, Sabbath Gang or Iron Maiden Gang, but the Purple, the Hammond, like yeah, ah, yeah. I would teach about them, like ah, it's not heavy Same enough, here. you know, yeah. But what are you talking about, Machine Head? <laughs> Machine I know. <laughs> I, I did, I, everybody thinks it came from there. I'm like, it didn't. I never got into it. Like, it but just. But, kinda... you know, but you know what? But then uh, years would pass, and uh, it would take me I don't know how many decades, but uh, it was maybe 15 years ago that I, or maybe 10 years ago. But then it's very, it's kind of embarrassing to admit that. Maybe 15 years ago, still embarrassing to admit that. I would finally got into Led Zeppelin and I would just bow down to Led Zeppelin. Say, Holy shit. Yeah. It's amazing. It's like, ah, like the heavens would just open up and you just see something absolutely divine. And, and, but you know what? I think it's amazing. It, what, what is amazing about, uh, like rediscovering bands for yourself is like, I'm 43. So maybe when I'm 60, I'm gonna, I'll be like, holy shit, this band, I've never dig them. But now I'm, I'm kind of, wow, it's amazing. You know what I mean? It's like, sometimes you have to grow up to something. Sometimes it's not like all the records. It's not the time of the record. So we just let it wait. Maybe in five yeah. years. It's, not, it's not what you need in your life at that point. You exactly. know, like I was the- I had that same kind of epiphany later on, like, you know, I liked it, but, I, but then you, you, as you grow, now you're an adult, you're a musician. You're like, Oh my God, like this is a whole other level that I didn't get, you know? But that is awesome. That is awesome. That, that, that actually, that keeps me uh, ever curious. And that makes me always searching for music, I always search for new music, but I always revisit the back catalog of, rock let's put it that way you know because i'm interested in rock music in general heavy metal is my main lover but there's others too but uh so i'm like when people ask me so what do you think of i don't know uh rush and i'm like i don't really know rush what about king crimson i'm like uh i'm not there yet that's my answer i'm not there yet so when people go, it's the same story. When people go like, so here you go, whiskey on the rocks. Nah, mix it with uh, Jack D. What? Yeah, man. I'm I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm, not, know, there I'm not much I'm not I'm not there yet. I'm I'm not mature enough to have a you know sip of you know straight whiskey from from a, from glass or whatever, mix it with uh, ice. It's exactly the same. So I never like bash bands for like, oh that's whatever king crimson like that no i'm like wait give me time give me a chance because maybe in 10 years when we do that podcast in 10 years like hey rob remember we were talking about king crimson holy shit it's amazing i I just discovered that band you know like about we will. We'll do this again in 10 years and we'll be like, did you ever get into King Crimson? <laughs> did, we, did you ever go down that route? I tell you yeah. what, I tell you, what, I never really got into King, King Crimson, but me and my friend Vance took it, took this hit of mescaline, you know, like acid and awesome. fucking this shit was the strongest fucking acid I've ever taken in my life, dude. And we went and we watched this video of King Kim Crimson playing Elephant Talk and I was just watching his fucking eyeballs melt out of his head and fucking playing this song called Elephant Talk. <laughs> Elephant Talk. And I was like, this is exactly what I want to see right now. <laughs> so, and that's literally my only that's my only King Crimson experience. Wow. See, for example, you know, to- yeah, sorry. No, go ahead. What's that? 
the another band is Pink Floyd. I mean, I started with Division Bell. Our drummer would play Division Bell, which I believe is the the last record. Pretty late, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, it took me, I mean, I, I would just get used to that song, <laughs> to that album, and then I go like, wow, I like it. I'm digging it. And then, you know, I started with this and just <laughs> going back catalog and just rediscovering like the elder stuff. And now I'm like, holy shit, you know, it's, it's, it's a great piece of music. And I started collecting vinyls and so on and so on. Like 20 years ago, I would be completely indifferent to that. I'm like, Pink Floyd, come on, man. It's for all dudes. Right, right. <laughs> right. What, what uh, you know, speaking of Alters of Madness and Morbid Angel, what was, uh, what was Covenant and those videos like Rapture and, I mean, what was that to a young Nurgle? So it's uh, early 90s. Poland is opening up. The curtain is fall, uh, has fallen. Uh, we got MTV and everyone is fucking watching MTV. And then you see first Nirvana. Uh, it's not heavy metal, but it's, you know, quite distorted guitars. It's kind of punky. I would, I, I thought it's cool, although I was already into, you know, radical stuff. I thought it's cool. So we got the grunge thing, uh, Guns N' Roses. I thought it's cool, although I needed something extreme. And then MTV, early 90s, for half, first half of 90s, they would play Morbid Angel. And it was, it was a game changer. It, um, not only that it felt, but they were high budget videos. They were. And, uh, awesome videos. And, make st and still they're awesome, you know, when I, every now and then I just go and back and watch all those videos. So yeah, uh, Morbid Angel, then Lake of Tears by uh, Pestilence, kind of post Morbid Angel, but very much inspired by that. And some other bands. That was a whole new planet. Just, you know, getting all this music that you, you love visualized. Mm -hmm. so with with whole like e rake bands and uh, Peaceville bands and uh, Slayer having the uh, divine in, no uh, uh, the aggression seasons you know no, the aggression oh. uh, the life album so oh, they right, got like right, the, right. The, the the black and white uh, live videos you know it was it was all on MTV in the early nineties and I would just of course you know I would collect VHS tapes and I would just have, you know make my own compilations and they just watch it over and over again so yeah it was it was a big deal for us i would feed on that so much and then man i always i always say that like you're this kid you know you watch mtv or you listen to this you know album or whatever and then you become friends with these people 20 years later you know what i mean it's like yeah it's like i see like holy shit that's awesome my life is awesome <laughs> right well, well, is, okay. is this... um, yeah go, go ahead. ahead no go ahead like this is you so, can talk as long as you want so yeah i mean like i remember uh i would get uh i am morbid by david vincent his biography that i actually think it's really really cool and there's a lot of really nice information there and uh and then we just read and send him like text messages like, ah, oh, shit, I didn't know you're a cab driver after domination. And I'm like, Ugh. and then we <laughs> oh, just, <shit. laughs> yeah, yeah, and I'm like, and then I always go back to that, to that fanboy uh, perspective, always. So like now we are, you know, friends from the stage and, you know, from friends from the backstage, we get drunk occasionally, we fucking chat and, and and we keep in contact and that's awesome but then every now and then i just i just go back to that fan mode and i'm like hmm. you know what i mean that that made you that created who you are it was your lecture it was your it was your feed it was your um teachers yes and, absolutely and, absolutely uh, and you know, I got, I got. That's a great of, way. That's a great way of putting it. That's a really great way of putting it. Those absolutely. are your teachers. They were, and 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 the fact that you know, now you're just 
friends, colleagues, buddies that can text each other and send silly photos or whatever, mm. or talk right. anything. It just makes life again, you know, I, I realize that life is absolutely magical. And what is happening with this, that's just another form of alchemy because something is, you know, we're just pouring something here and something is coming out here, you know, and it's like, holy shit. And you have to just see your life in a larger scale, larger picture. And then you see the little Nigel, there I go, that's how I call myself. Um, but you You're see the little that, Nigel? <laughs> yeah, a little Nigel. <laughs> Okay. Real Nigel. <laughs> <laughs> and it, <yeah. laughs> so I'm, I'm, call, I'm, call, uh, I'm, uh, I call it like sowing the seeds, okay? And you never right. know what, what, what's gonna grow up, you know? And, and then you see things growing up, and then you're like, I think it's important to remember that, to memorize that, who you were, what you become. And just embrace that experience and embrace his friendships. Yeah. Yeah. And I got that with, I don't know, Slayers. You probably, you know, I, I'm going to mention some of those bands and then you're going to mention some of your bands. Okay. Okay. So Morbid Angel, Danzig, fucking Rob Halford. Oh, oh. yeah. Priest. Uh, uh, priest. Um, oh, Rob Halford solo or, or Judas Priest? Uh, both. Either way, either way, both. Yeah. Uh, Danzig. These are some of the guys that I would just look up to when I was a kid. And, and, and then, you know, you just run to the guy and he goes like, I'm talking about Metal God. Hey, what's up, Nurgle? Yeah, I'm following your Instagram account. It's really entertaining. And I'm like... <laughs> uh, 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 and you're about like saying, you're talking to me? You're talking to me? It doesn't compute sometimes, right? It, 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 it doesn't compute. And then, and then uh, me and Gary Holt, we we're sitting backstage like, and fuck it. And he goes like to me. And then I can go to him the same like that, you know, like we're just making this weird uh, triangle. I don't want that sound uh, per pervert, but, uh, and he goes like, yeah, Rob Halford just texted me. Can you imagine fucking <laughs> Rob Halford? And you get that from uh, Gary Holt who's already a legend, you know what I mean? Yes, so, yes. But it's cool, you know, that they got Gary, who's another dear friend of mine, and he's like, he could be my younger, uh, sorry, my awesome. older brother. And he's one yes. of my teachers, again, he For can sure. feel, he, he still feels small. He still feels like a fanboy. And I believe that um, Gary King got the same with Judas Priest, because yes. you know they grew up just being a priest cover yeah, band. Sure, totally, we're and all fans. Yeah, and oh, and there's one more that I must mention here is King Diamond, of course. Yeah, <sighs> Merciful Fate, King Diamond. Uh -huh. Yes, man. Yeah. Okay, I can sign off on every. I can sign off on every one of those for sure. Exodus. I mean, Exodus was. You know, I'm in the Bay Area. I'm a 16 year old kid going to see Exodus. You know, open for Metallica at you know a 200 capacity club you know like it's and metallica is opening for raven so metallica is not even headlining you know what i mean this is like and we're just headbanging and you know I, we meet paul bailoff from exodus we meet headfield and like you know i think in a lot of ways um you know and gary holt gary holt is the first lead solo that i ever learned how to play Ever. So his solo in Bonded by Blood is the first guitar solo I ever learned how to play all the way through. So you talk about somebody who's a teacher. That was my teacher. Like literally the first solo I could ever play all the way through. And just so much of Exodus and, you know, certainly Metallica, you know, and just being able to Slayer, absolutely. You know, we, we were playing our first show. The first shows I ever did were just like, we were playing Backyards. You know what I mean? Like we were playing, I was in Fremont, which is like 50 miles away from the Bay Area. And back then it might've been 500 miles away. And so we'd play kegger parties. We'd get our older friends 
our older high school people to go buy a keg of beer, like the big, you know, container of beer. Damn. And then we'd just sit, we'd just set up in a backyard and we'd play Black Magic by Slayer. We'd play A Lesson in Violence by Exodus, Whiplash by Metallica. And all of our friends would just come, punk rock friends and skater friends. And they just fucking circle pit and headbang. And it was just this crazy, wild fucking time. And and we were just nobodies. We were just a bunch of nobodies playing some backyard 50 miles from where are the action. And they didn't even know who we were. You know, like none of those guys even knew who we were. We were just, you know emulating what we saw and loving the aggression and the craziness and, and all of it, you know? So I loved, I loved what you said about teachers because it's so, it's so true. And then you, you know, you meet those people, you become, I mean, we were on tour with heaven and hell and black, like you said, black Sabbath, black Sabbath for me was like, that was the gateway drug for me. I had been doing judo and jujitsu I was really focused on that. My family moved. It was kind of weird. And like, I ended up quitting jujitsu, hearing Black Sabbath and smoking weed all in the same like two day period. You know, it was like my life just pivoted and I went this. And then from that point on, it was like, I want to make that sound that Black Sabbath makes. I want to smoke weed. I want to, you know, get snow blind. I want to hang out with dirty women. And, you know, like I just everything about that. And, and then we're on tour with heaven and hell. This is 20 years later or whatever. And I remember walking out of the dressing room and Tony Iommi walked out of the dressing room and I, we hadn't spoken until that point. And he goes, Oh, Hey Rob. And I was all, Oh, Hey Tony Iommi. <laughs> how's, how's it going? <laughs> like, like, fuck, like, Oh, like I just thought you'd, th you know, in your head, like you get, you think like the guy's going to think you're a crew guy or something or a tech or something. And then you end up talking. And so I totally, I completely relate. And that, and I think that's such a good place to, 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 you know, like you gotta, I think that is one of the essences of rock and roll. And then in a lot of ways, that's why, you know, we stay, I think people who play rock and roll play heavy metal, like we stay younger partially because of that, you know, like that spirit, you know, is always ever present in what we're, you know, what we are. Yeah. I think what I learned from, you know, meeting the guys that are, you know, that I look up to, what I've learned, one of the biggest lessons is uh, uh, how not to be an asshole. Right. And how to actually be nice to uh, other bands, you know, because, well, I mean, I'm not saying that I'm, always very nice because I have, you know, good moments and bad moments, but seeing how you can like a, a guy from fucking from Poland, from some black metal band, you know, that you probably you know why you even know me or like you heard my name, you know, and then you're just being treated like, like really nice by, I don't know, like Lars Ulrich, you know, when I met him, he was like, it was like super nice and uh, we just pay attention and uh, holy shit, I was like, wow. I mean, I can't, I, it kind of made me revisit some of my um, attitudes. I'm like, I should look up to those guys, you know? So whenever I kind of learned, you know, that you, you never don't, I mean, sometimes you have no other option, you know, in most cases, you know, because you know, when we take bands on tours, I always like to be mm, nice guy, you know, a, a, a good host, a generous host. And even if I have a bad day, just I want to deal with it here or somewhere when I'm alone. But when I'm approaching these guys, that let's call it this hierarchy, right? So when there's, there's always guys that are way bigger than yourself and smaller than yourself, treat them well. I mean, it doesn't really cost much to shake hands, you know, buy them beer if they, you know, get no catering or whatever. Just be a better person, be a better host, be a better musician in the end of the day. You know what I mean? And I think I've been fortunate to meeting of those guys and uh, some of them you know have the reputation of being mm -mm -mm. i'm not gonna you know mention any names but then i've always been treated like super nice you know by all the mention and all the ones that i mentioned and and 
others like others do and uh, i'm like holy shit you know if like the top guys can you know be like equals and they never look down at you you can do this too you know what i mean i don't know if you had that you know i mean I, i've had some shitty moments in my career i acted like an asshole a few times or more but um i don't think it's worth and i don't think it's cool you know i mean sometimes you must be an asshole to someone and sometimes you act, you have to act like this there's no other option but this is the last option you know before that yeah. just be generous be um be nice be 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 normal be be okay be a decent human being you know so that is a very important lesson that i've learned from from those guys going back to uh the beginning and you're starting to get a band going you're starting to play maybe your first shows uh is 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 vader around at this point like i'm trying to think of like other polish bands that may have inspired you and yeah yeah i remember when i saw vader in uh, like there was this big opener festival uh, maybe two hours drive from my place and i went there and they were supposed to go on and at uh, 10 or 11 p.m but everything was just so disorganized and so delayed that they played at 5 a.m holy shit yeah it was wow. summer i was already i was already uh, i was like 16 or 17 behemoth was already i think we recorded the first or second demo and i remember i managed to go backstage and just shake hands with peter and i was blown away amazing show so yeah yeah there were some some of those bands that were around and already just going up there and you know you know paving a uh, way for others to follow including uh, uh behemoth yeah, for sure course. what, are, you, what uh, are your first sh- what are your first shows like are you are you as theatrical no, as no, you are no, now no. back then yeah okay oh no, first show i was very shy and uh, it was the fir- very first show i we wouldn't use any corpse paint because i don't know why i was this oh, the first experience and it was really lame of course and I was. Is it, what's the What's the first experience like? Is it a club show? Like, are you playing a? Yeah, it's are you a playing club a backyard? <laughs> no, it's a club show. It's um, it's in our in our neighborhood. It's I don't know a couple of hundred people, and we are like newcomer. I don't know. The band has been around for what one or two years, and uh, we just yeah. And I don't think we have an official demo out yet. And we just is it all originals, on, like, all originals, huh? cover songs, all originals, all originals, and a Hellhammer cover, and yeah, that's okay. it. So, but it was super lame, super lame. And uh, and Tri- then are you doing Triumph of Death, <laughs> Triumph of no, Death cover. No, no, we did Aggressor, Aggressor nice. from from um, from Apocalyptic Rides, and yeah, yeah. and it was, since you ask, yeah, since you ask about um, those times, you know. We, uh, back then there was no internet uh, there was no, no access uh, we wouldn't really have access to originals or if there were originals for Hellhammer no one would have lyrics so what we would right. do we would just phonetically try to replicate the lyrics <laughs> we would hardly awesome. speak any English I mean little English like not, not very like uh, fluent not very smooth and we just uh, okay we just, just put it down and try to replicate. <laughs> that was easy. That was the Get easiest the part. Warrior. Ooh. So, uh, <laughs> so like, yeah. So lately, uh, when uh, uh, Tom asked me to go on stage, you know, in Warsaw, when uh, Triumph, of, Triumph of Death, uh, Hellhammer, uh, was playing, I was like, yeah, let's do Aggressor, and like first time. Ever, I would just sing the actual lyrics, you know. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> you finally so, learned them twenty years later. That's killer. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so say, your first experience, so your first experience wasn't good, though. You're saying, like, your first live show, like, you didn't. What wasn't good about it? Like, you just didn't. You know what? We couldn't open up. I'd say I'd say with live, ex- like, with 
live shows, it's pretty much the same like with sex, you know, like name a guy who would say that like his first experience was epic. Right, it's right. Like, uh, no. <laughs> Sorry. like quote, quote, quoting a classic too drunk to fuck and so on, so right. on. Uh, just right, just right. coming out as a complete asshole, you know, not but being able to um, complete the task. And are, your so, par- are your parents there? Are your parents there watching you? Uh, no, 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 no. It was, no. it was, uh, it was a camp. It was a camp. Everyone was drunk. Okay. Uh, I was 16 uh, and she was 20, a young mom. So when you're 16 and the girl is 20, you look... Wait, you're talking about your first time you had sex? Yes. Oh, okay, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> I was are still, you, still talking about the show. Are you the show? Oh, keep going, right? keep going. This, this is great. <laughs> I'm asking about the show, but... <laughs> okay, no, 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 no. My parents weren't... Back then, they weren't really interested in what I did. They were just interested. Just, just make sure you make it from class to class. Right. You, you graduate. You finish school. That's what wow, they would that's... be interested in. Uh, it took them, cool them. Yeah, but it, it would take them quite some time to realize that holy shit, he's actually making his living off the music. So maybe it's not that bad after all. So then they really kind of realized that. Uh, yeah, it's 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 my raison d'être. That's that's why I live for. You know, it's it's who I am. So they kind of started like even liking it, not only supporting but liking the fact that I'm traveling musician and uh, I don't need you know I don't have this you know um, nine to five job and my life is actually very interesting. It's not easy, but it's the best job in the world. <laughs> Let's go, let's go back to your first time having sex since you already went there. So you're 16, she's 20. And she's 20. Look how flexible you are. Look how flexible you are. You just did that. I can't even fucking, that's crazy. So, 16, uh, she's 20. You're at camp. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm it's called, like summer, summer camp, like a summer camp? Yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. Go, summer okay. camp, yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm drunk as fuck, you know, so this, I don't even... I would, I mean, calling it a, a, a copulation would be a, a you know, a, a big exaggeration. Okay, it's how, how long? But, how long do you last? How long do you last? Like good two minutes, <laughs> three minutes? Um, probably shorter than that. <laughs> <laughs> right. I know, I, right. I, it was it was super lame, you know. But I kind of, but I counted that in. I was like, yes, yes. You know what I mean. Totally, balls, yeah. out, balls out, you're just laying, you're just getting into that sleazy, you know, primitive, you know, thing. And you're feeling like a man, although you're just a lame, uh, <laughs> pathetic uh, <laughs> guy who just thinks that he got, just got laid, you know, but it was just, it was so pathetic. But then again... And then you, and then do you stay in the same camp with the girl? Like the girl is still in the camp for the next couple, uh, like a week or so? No, no, no. Uh, I was there with my uh, soon to come girlfriend. Okay. Oh, jeez. So, yes. okay. so oh, not we, yet your girlfriend. Gotcha. Yeah. We came together. She would just sleep with, with another guy, lose virginity with another guy. And now we just fuck around with that, you know, 20 year old girl. So uh, just, you know, I wanted to make that comment. When you're 16 and the chick is 20, she's, she, you look up to her as, as a, 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 a totally mature woman. Yeah, like a woman, yeah. Yeah, it's a proper woman. And then she was a young mother too. So I'm like, holy shit. She's not like, you know, equal. So it felt serious, okay? But anyway, so uh, I went with her uh, my ex-girlfriend went with the other guy and that caused like some argument but then we're like okay so let's now let's try to do it together and that's how we became uh, a couple for the next three years and that was my my longest uh, relationship wow yeah wow that's (laughs) awesome so then from 16 to 19 you've got a you're in a relationship with a girlfriend yeah, then I'm uh, around, around there. Yeah, and then I'm at the university, and I'm like, ah, I think I think I deserve better. 
And uh, speaking of assholes, I was probably the the, the the biggest asshole back then, you know. As a person, I was just I was just not cool to her and to to other people. So not cool. But I have no problems with admitting that, you know, that's that's why we live our lives to, you know, to yeah, learn totally. how to treat out other people. Yeah. I mean, most, uh, yeah, I was a I was a complete cunt when I was eighteen and nineteen. I was a slut when I was eighteen, nineteen years old. I was a complete slut. Yeah, I was uh, a little shit, you know, with no respect to to uh, to to anyone. But anyways, um, when uh, like every time I look back, you know, and just look at that, I'm like, I'm laughing, okay? I'm laughing and I'm, uh, that's what you said, you know, when people ask you, oh, can you do uh, the Vigian, you know, part two or whatever? I'm like, can I look like, you know, 16 again or 20 again or even 25 or 30 again? No, it's like, you cannot replicate that. You're a different person. Yesterday, you were a different person. This morning, because it's evening in where I am now, I was a different person. So when you get that perspective of who you are, you know, in you know, in a in this you know, in this linear um, uh, time frame, you just cannot replicate. You know, because if you try to go back and try to replicate something you're most likely end up doing something worthless and pathetic and just why? No, that's wrong. That's the, yeah. What's no. the first, uh, what's the first tour that, that you guys do? Uh, we got an offer. It was the second album we put out on a small German label. Uh, and it was, like, it was actually the first, it was first, professional shows we did as well it was proper tour a tour bus mm -hmm. so before are you, doing, are you sharing are you sharing a tour bus with another yeah. band we are sharing a tour bus in europe with three other bands one from poland christ agony one from norway hellheim and we are uh, we have a second album out it's 96 so five years the band is was uh, was around for five years and uh we go and play uh, European clubs and we do anything from 150 to a couple of hundred people, two or three. I think the biggest show was like maybe 500 people. And back then it was like, wow. That's three a lot, yeah. Quite unknown acts to get some, you know, buzz going on, but nothing really big. And we pull these crowds and we felt like, oh, not a bad start. Not bad, not bad. Yeah. Who's headlining? Who's the we headliner? Were headlining. Yeah, we were oh, headlining. You're the headliner. Okay. Yeah, we is were this headlining. your first time outside of, is this your first time outside of Poland? No, uh, we did three abroad shows. We did like a small festival in Holland, in a club. Uh, a few months before that tour, we did one shitty show in the middle of the forest somewhere in germany like 300 <laughs> people cold as fuck it's june it's cold and in flames is playing before us and then we're headlining what? <laughs> but holy shit in flames was like meant nothing back then i mean it was just some band from sweden playing melodic metal ah it was okay and uh, we were nobodies as well. And then right. they put up this festival. There was 300 people in the middle of nowhere. And uh, yeah, I, I do remember that festival. I do remember that experience too, you know. I remember it just to get anywhere in Europe from Poland. We had to rent uh, either a van. Like we'd get like a ticket on a proper uh, cruise bus. Okay. So let's say, uh, let's say uh, oh, you, there was no there was no buses in Poland. You'd have to were, go to. No, no. Uh, first of all, we we could like back then and for next long long years we couldn't afford flights. No one would think, mm -hmm. oh, we're flying somewhere. What? No fucking right. way. So let's say the festival is close to um, Brooklyn. So we are buying a cruise ticket for a van for like regular passengers 
We just get there with guitars on the van. The van would travel for 18 hours to Köln. Then the promoter would wait for us in Köln or send someone. And then he would buy us a cab for the next three hours to go to this festival. They would jump wow. us there, would play. And then we'd buy a ticket, let's say... Uh, 48 hours later on the same van that would pick up all the passengers and the same gas station uh, in Köln near, uh, near a railway station or whatever. It was a very primitive way of traveling. But that was mm-hmm. early, early democratic times in Poland. It was, it was a growing business, very shaky because you would, you'd be dumped at some gas station and there was a meeting point and they would just pick you up there. And you would have only like a 30 minute um, gap to show up, get on board, or be dumped. Oh, you know what I mean? Wow, crazy. It, yeah. was, it was very weird, you know. Like now when I look back, you know, how, uh, because it wasn't, it wasn't precise at all. Yeah. The, the van could be, because it's just a van or a bus, you know, it could be. Yeah. Some it's just a pa- it's a other pa- and other passengers are on there with you, just people you yeah. don't even know, right? Yeah. yeah. And then the van could arrive three hours earlier, so we just stand there in the middle of nowhere, just waiting for someone to pick you up, or it, because it's a van or it's a um, traffic or this uh, shitty weather conditions, you get there six hours later. Holy shit! And on the top of that, of course, it's it's mid 90s there's no cell phones so there's only like the you know yeah, the old pay school phones or, yeah yes. the pay phones but then you're calling a house only or an office you know but the guy might have left you know how, how yeah rob how did we live back then yeah yeah i mean i, mean, <laughs> I remember sure. the pay phone. I, I remember what we would do i would call the guy call the promoter Let's say to, today is what? Today is Thursday. So I'm telling him, okay, we are arriving Monday, 5 p.m. in Bishopswerda in uh, Germany. Uh, can you pick us up? Yeah, but please do pick us up because if you're not there, <laughs> we, we're stuck. Right. And, and you would have to rely 100% of this guy's honesty and his yeah. responsibility and his professionalism. But, yes. we're, we're, but all of us, we're all amateurs, complete amateurs, just daydreaming. We're just you know, like fucking kids in a, in a fog. You know what I mean? But somehow we would pull it off. Somehow we would make things happen. We would get to those places. We'd play these shows, go back home, piece by piece, not asking money. We would do the first tour and we were just happy to be on the road. Yeah. Getting pizza every night, getting beer every night, and having our records being sold and merchandise being sold every night at the merch booth. But none of us would even ask, hey, is there any penny coming for the band from those shows or from merchandise? Uh-uh. None yeah, of right. us would ask that. We're just a bunch of kids happy to get their 15 minutes because maybe there's no other tour coming. Guys, this is it. We just, you know, got to give, give it back, give it our, you know, best shot. And that's it. Just living uh, rock and roll, living, you know, you know, just eating pizza, beer, and talking about Man of War, you know, and that would make us happy. Just, yeah. You know, I mean, it's super naive, super naive. And like that, this, it would just go for years and years. And then we just learn how this old business, monkey business works. And uh, yeah, but uh, I like thinking about those times, you know. I don't really talk often about those um, um, tours and shows, but uh, what, it was rough. Were there, some, were, there, were there any bands that were there any bands of note that you started touring with around that time, like two thousand to two thousand three, like somewhere? Do you, do, you ever, do you tour with Vader at any point? You know, I'm just wondering yeah. like, if Vader takes Polish bands out. I mean, Decapitated no, no. may have Decapitated may have started around this time as well. 
Yeah, I mean, like every now and then we just cross uh, paths and across did some tours. Not abroad. We do Polish tours together with the Capitated Invader. I believe it was in 2000. It was called Trashable Festivals. All three bands would tour on the same oh, cool. bill with Chris Yuna. It was a cool tour. It was a big tour too. I mean, like packed venues and it was nice. Uh, so yeah, um, we would meet Vader every now and then at some festivals. Now I remember we end up in Czech Republic and uh, Vader goes on stage and uh, I believe one of the amps just you know goes down. And of course, you know, yeah, just boom. We'll just land them an amp so they can continue. Just an mm-hmm. anecdote, you know. But yeah, every now and then we just cross cross paths. Um, yeah. And then somewhere in there, you start leading up to, and this is where Behemoth kind of comes on my radar, is around the Demigod era. Oh, yeah. You yeah. know, like you guys, I'd already heard the name. I like started seeing kids wearing the shirts and stuff. But I, I was asked specifically by uh, Martin Carlson, actually, who does the Sweden Rock magazine. Martin Carlson gave me a stack of CDs and he wanted me to review the CDs for Sweden Rock. And uh-huh. so I was like, all right. And it had a couple of like, you know, Portishead type bands and it had some kind of, you know, traditional heavy metal bands and then, it, and then Behemoth. And I remember we were on the Through the Ashes tour. This is in 2004 uh-huh. or whatever. And I remember putting that, it was a CD. So we've, we've reached CD points at this, <laughs> at this point of the conversation. Yeah, with yeah, CDs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I put the CD in and I was like, holy shit. I was like, this is fucking savage. Like it was, fu- I mean, it was, it was the CD of the, of the, that I reviewed. That was my, whatever, that was my top pick oh, wow. or whatever. So I, and I just, I loved the imagery, like the whole, like the vibe of it, you know, like you're there, you know, it was just this very cool vibe. What's the, you know, like uh, to me and to me, like I've gone back and listened to the earlier behemoth stuff. And to me, that record was really like a transition point for you guys where you really like, I don't know, maybe your song craft or maybe just yeah. like, you know, maybe you've reached, you know, something, I don't know, maybe what, what, what changed for that record? Um, I mean, again, even like the way you presented yourself, like the way you presented yourself, yeah. it seemed like you really like connected with something. I think it was a very empowering album and there was a lot of anger and frustration. Again, I was heartbroken. So I get some of that, uh, you know, let out through the music, but I was, I think particularly at this very period, I was so determined to make statement with the band and, uh, you know, I mean, I think it's, it was pretty resentmental, but I really wanted to prove something. And uh, <laughs> now I see it that way, really, you know, like on many occasions, you know, I really wanted to prove something to not only the scene and label and bandmates, but uh, when I would just split with a girl that I was so much in love with, I was like, holy fuck, fuck that, you know, now I'm going to invest all my passion into the music and uh if this is not happening if this i cannot pull this off you know i can if i cannot make myself happy with another person then i'm gonna do everything i can humanly can to make my you know to put all that love in my band and just make it as powerful and us um you know just just devastating and fucking monumental as I can. And I had that, you know, I, I had, I, I mean, like some, well, I got some, you know, criticism about that, you know, like even these days, you know, that I'm like exaggerating, that I'm like thinking uh, like this bigger than life kind of approach. But man, I mean, we're artists, you know, we're, pe- we are, we are people from the stage, you cannot just go on stage and be like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm here, I'm going to play my song. Well, you can if you, if you are, I don't know, uh, fucking Neil Young. You can just, right, just right. be there and just be boring and that's, that's still magic, Neil Young. I love him. But this is fucking heavy metal. It was meant to be big as fuck. Venom, Priest, Maiden, it must be big, just think bigger. So even, 
you have limitations here. You must just do that and just go out from yourself and just, okay, you're not big enough. Make people think you're bigger than you actually are. And I know it's an art of illusion, you know, but what you see live, the videos, the aesthetics and everything, you know, it's all illusion in a way. But it really is, I mean, I'm not trying to say that I'm like uh, uh, the, the social techniques that I've learned just, you know, to fool people. No, but that's why I go on stage, you know. I can, off stage, I can be miserable and just, uh, I feel depressed today. I feel sad. And, but there's no time for that kind of feelings on stage. On stage, right. you own this motherfucking realm and you are the king there. And even for one hour or 80 minutes or sometimes 25 minutes, you know that. But right, hey, right. this is it. I'm here to fucking prove myself, to make a statement because maybe there's no tomorrow. So I started having this kind of attitude, this kind of life philosophy. And uh, with Demigod being the first album in, that we would release in the US that we would tour for. Right. I was like, okay, this is, we, 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 we're going to, you know, make it, break it or make it. And there's, we're taking no prisoners. The band was on the verge of um, splitting up on, during some of those tours. It was really, wow. it was just brutal, you know, fucking gang of guys on the van, uh, different characters, no money, yeah. no money alcohol, debts. Uh, is it sa- it's the same guys, the same guys from pretty much? Uh, same no, two guys, two guys the same. Uh, we started, no, Demi, no, Demigod is the same lineup. Yeah. Demigod yeah. was the first album we recorded with the same lineup that is still existing, which is, we, we've, uh, like during rehearsal a week ago, we, we talk about it, that it's a huge, um, that we see that as a big value, you know, because there's no many bands that could m- like maintain like same people for like now almost 20 years. We got a drummer. We were together for like over 20 years, 23, maybe 22. Yeah. Inferno, Inferno was from the previous lineup yeah, yeah. From, before from, from, God, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, Orion and Seth, they started in uh, 2003 or something. So it's now it's 17 years yeah. or 18. Yeah. Man, it's like... It's it's long time together. And, you, uh, do you get? Are you do you change labels on Demigod? Like, is this like the first time you get to like a, a label, or is it just like uh, the buzz on the band is so big that like the U.S. you know you no, get your no, first no, American no, no, no. thing? We 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 were on Olympic, which was owned by Century Media, and then Century Media just decided, okay, Behemoth goes on directly on Century Media. Okay. So uh, and they felt like okay, uh, we believe in this band. We just we they kept on. Uh, giving us a tour support and we we would just kept on coming back and nailing nailing pushing awesome. harder and harder that's awesome for demigod we would do approximately uh 300 shows how many and for demigod and only 300 is that what you said 300 and uh that's a lot. uh out of which uh, U.S. only is 150 in the U.S. only. Wow! So 100 shows. It's 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 a lot. It's, it's fucking it was, a lot of touring. It was five tours in U.S. I was going to say it sounds about five tours. There's five. The, yeah, there's five tours. Uh, brutal tours. Diverse tours. Uh, shitty tours. Uh, I remember touring with fucking Asale dying playing before us, and we were just. You know, I would always fuck with them saying because I knew that they were from Christian. You know, like, <laughs> Christian. Christian. <laughs> but I'm like, I'd be like, I'd be like approaching the vocalist, like, hey, worry not. It's not today. What not today? We're not throwing you to Christians today. <laughs> always playing, always poking. But no, no, don't get me wrong. It was, it, it was, it was, I mean, it was in a friendly way, you know, poking, right. but in a friendly way. And even today, when we come across each other, they're good guys, you know, because yeah. like a man, man, I'm like, Nick, Nick yeah, yeah. is the best. Like Nick is yeah, such a fucking nice guy. I'm, I mean, I came across like, like guys, you know, from like different bands and 
throughout all those years. And um, now I know, but it, it always comes down to, to, to human beings that we are. Just if you're a cool person, I'll be a cool person, you know. Honestly, in the end of the day, I don't give a fuck what you believe in, who you sleep with, what, you know, what color your skin is. It's none of my business. I don't care, man. You're a cool guy. I'm a cool guy. Shake hands. We're brothers. We share stage tonight. We eat shit every night. We just, you know, carrying our own equipment, playing what like 150 guarantees? That's how we started, I believe. 150 dollars. 150 dollars. 150 dollars. Yeah. That was on, that's all those, on all those demigod tours. No, no, no. It was. It would improve. Uh, yeah. Uh, now, John Finberg. <laughs> John Finberg. Two words. We, we have that in common. We have that in common, John Finberg. <laughs> two words. Sorry, two words that says it all. Okay. Uh, so we would just we wouldn't we would just take whatever came like every offer and we just push like bite our bite our teeth just bite the bullet and push push and uh, and then I tell you what, in defense of John Finberg he does book a lot of fucking tour he'll put you you'll be playing every night <laughs> like. He, uh, he, you bet. You, know, you bet, man. Yeah. You'll you'll be hitting the road. Like you want to hit the road, he'll he'll get you on the road, yeah. man. Anyways, uh, shout out to yeah, John Finberg. I think we we definitely squeezed all the juices out of that <laughs> orange or a lemon. What was what was the final tour that you did from that from that leg in America? Uh. Mm, Maybe it was Blackest of the Black with Danzig, where we were oh, somewhere in, in the middle of the bill, and that was already um, maybe $500 guarantee. So within okay. one cycle, we would just go up from 150 to 100 to 500. But I might be wrong, you know, because my memory is what, really. What year, was, what year was that? What, what, what year would that have been? 2004 or five. Okay. Okay. That's a good, that's a good bill though, man. And that must've been so fucking, I mean, your first time in America, like this has got to be like, you just got to be fucking stoked as fuck. Like, Oh my God, like we're fucking yeah. doing it. Yeah. I mean, uh, absolutely. Uh, for some reason, uh, I mean, it's, was this it, a dream? I mean, this is, a, this is like every European band's think, dream, right? To yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. But uh, a lot of European bands never make it uh, after their first and last experience. And you know why? Yeah. Because the uh, American market is, can be very rough and, can, and it's very challenging. And when you're, and we were already an established band in Europe, a nightliner band, right. making money on tours, bringing money back home. And then you end up in a van, in a shitty van, with, you know, same guys, you know, farting and puking and fucking in the same. Uh, how big is that? You know, not bigger than, than, than the bed that I'm, I, I'm sitting on now. Yeah. And you got all these guys and... And, and all you, your gear and all your... <laughs> everything, like, on the top of that, like, fucking bunch of gypsies. And uh, you're making no money. I remember uh, we just bring our own shirts on tours from Poland. And I remember between, uh, what, six guys back then, uh, we would manage to just, like, in between our, like, uh, civil clothes and, like, private stuff in our suitcases, we just, like, you know, put, like, all this merchandise from Poland. But guess what? Yes. I managed to, uh, to count all the shirts that we brought. So between... Now you have to use your imagination or whoever is watching, use your imagination. Six guys, a uh, few suitcases, big suitcases. We, we would squeeze 400 shirts. Wow. That's a lot. That's a lot, dude. Yeah. You know, it's a lot. Some people are like, what is 400 shirts? No, it's a lot. That's a you know, fucking I don't know. lot. Yeah. I don't know how we did that, but we did it. And then we just like first, like And, the, next and this day. is the merchandise for the whole tour. This is no, the no, merchandise no, no, for the whole tour. No, okay, no, that gotcha. was merchandise that we got. Like we got like some license deal in Poland, so we got it right. uh, in trade for license. 
So there was mm-hmm. a chance for us to bring it and it was just pure cash. Yeah, sell it. Yeah, totally. sell it. And, and then, of course, you know, it was me just calling some local, um, sh- you know, merchandisers. I'm like, hey, I'm friends of this and that guy. I got the phone call, uh, the, your sale from that guy. Can you make us X amount of shirts? For and just, man, using our Polish phones because we didn't know how to, <laughs> we, right. we just didn't know how to navigate US. We were learning how to how to survive on tour in US. And, uh, but we were so determined. And I remember that we were so determined. We would eat shit and still play. I remember one tour with open for suffocation. And Inferno, a drummer, he would got uh, um, um, his, uh, like a tooth poison or something. Oh, right, right. And uh, it, it went really bad. It went really bad. And he was just, he was on hard medicines and he was fucking dying. And at the same time, I was having a strap throat. Oof. It's brutal. And I didn't know if, it's, if it was a strap throat. And uh, I would just use like, you know, all these bullshit, like throat sprays and, but if you know, you, but you know that strap throat is uh, not a virus. It's an uh, um, bacteria. It's like a, bacteria. a bacterial infection. So yeah. you must treat it with antibiotic, either or you, you know, you just lay to rest for three weeks and maybe it's gone or maybe not. But you're in tour on tour. You're getting paid uh, two hundred fifty dollars a night, and you can't afford not to play a show because yeah. if you don't get you don't get that money. You had no money for fuel and you have no per diems. You're not going to survive. Nothing, no room for hotel. You know, like, even if you're getting uh, exactly, that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we, we wouldn't get hotels every night. You know, most of those tours, we would just get one band room every two or three nights. So, uh, it depends, you know, on the weather conditions. You and know, then sleep in, sleep in, sleep in the van. You'd sleep in the no, van. Like just uh, okay. So the um, the merchandiser or uh, manager would drive overnight, and we just sleep in a van. You get gotcha. to the venue, you crush um, the backstage, extra nap or whatever, right. and you're ready to go. Right. Insane. I I could never do it these days. Not only because I'm not uh, 28 anymore, but uh, I don't know, man. Just I think it's I did rough, my. Man. I I think it's it's a joke, obviously, but I think I did a lot of yoga back then. You know, sitting like <laughs> in a van, like in this position, like. Oh, <laughs> I did a lot fucking, of yoga before. Stop, I lied to you that I I, I did it for me. years. <laughs> really, don't <laughs> stop sweating on me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, I, th- I didn't finish my story, but, but it was pretty brutal. So I had a strap throat and I didn't know it's a strap throat, you know, so I couldn't speak. I was like, <laughs> and, but then we had like a 40 minute set, you know, and then, you know, the adrenaline, you know, pumps up and Inferno goes on stage, high fever with this, with his face being fucking swollen like that. And I go on stage, I spit blood and I grow. <laughs> And I don't know how I do it for 40 minutes or I'm faking doing it, but I'm doing something, imitating Mm -hmm. some scary noises, whatever. But hey, check, check, check. We make shows, okay? And then first thing I get off stage, I spill blood and I cannot speak because I can only, I can only grow. But then before and like, off stage, I cannot talk because it's like it. The pain is unbearable. It's just like swallowing right. uh, needles. Like oh yeah. So then we are in Canada. I I didn't uh, add the very important fact. It's middle of winter, so it's min- minus twenty Celsius or something. Oof. Oh, it's not helping. Yeah. Uh, so it's Canada, and someone told me, hey, uh, the health uh, system here is more friendly than the U.S. Go and check yourself. So I right. spent a fortune back then, you know, but I spent like 50 or $80 for a doctor visit. Back then, just considering like all those 
right. all this money that we're getting, it's it's that it's might so be all the money you make from a tour. Yeah. Exactly. But still, I spend that money and I get antibiotic. I still, you know, manage to pull some of the shows, you know, and then I get back to normal. But uh, now I know. And when I talk to doctors, now I know. But back then I was stupid, you know, because when you have strap throat and when you force your uh, vocal cords during strap throat, you can um, severely damage your uh, cords, uh, maybe even forever. Yeah. But then, you know, you're just naive. You are so driven, so motivated, and you take no prisoners. So when I tell people or when I tell, when someone asks me how, how it was back then, I'm like for at least half of the career or most of it, it felt like at war. Oh, you're exaggerating. No, I'm not. For us, it was like at war. It felt like, I remember uh, reading that book from David Vincent and he told me that he liked that, that when, when he's on tour, when he's getting ready on stage, it feels like, you know, like a soldier getting ready for a battle. And uh, you probably have, maybe have kind of similar rituals, you know, you, you don't get too relaxed, you know, you, you have to, yeah, get your yeah. stamina oh, together yeah, totally. and just, yeah, you totally get in a mindset it's like just to fucking crush everything yeah and it takes away all, like a lot of energy from you and everything you know but i mean that's what it is you know it's like being at war there's a battle that's your battlefield you know you gotta test yourself you know and uh you either live on the shield or with the shield <laughs> we become friends we meet each other on sounds the, the 2006 sounds of the underground 2006 this is yeah. still this is still demigod yeah is this, is this apostasy yeah i think it's uh before apostasy i think it's still demigod yeah 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 remember yeah that. and this is and this is awesome and i was like i remember watching you guys i was like these motherfuckers probably hate machine head <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at the cord, looking at the cord paint, and, I, and then you come up and like, Rob, we brought some Polish beers, and like, let's drink yeah. some beers, like we big fans, like through the ashes, yeah. and I was like, oh wow, and we fucking we hung out, and I remember being very very impressed. I mean, just fucking you guys killing it every fucking night, like bringing it hard, like bringing it hard, and yeah. uh, it was. I, mean, I think even on the last night, our last night there, you guys came up and sang Davidian with us, like you and a bunch <laughs> of the guys came up, and it was like in many, so Minneapolis cool. at that one, one, the, the, the civic hall or whatever it was, a civic yeah. center. That was a, that was a fun, that was a great tour and a fun. Yeah, event. absolutely. I love it. I think you jumped. As for like five or six shows. You, uh -oh. you hear me? I think you're, you're freezing here. Oh, okay. 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 I can hear you right now. Yeah. Uh, you did like five or six shows on the tour, right? You didn't do Who Do The Hold. Yes, yes. And I believe the first show was either, was Cleveland? Uh, I think, I it yeah, was I think Cleveland, the, first, but, the first show might have been the Bay Area. The first, it might have been the Bay Area that might have been the first show. But, and then we worked uh, our way east. Yeah, but uh, I remember maybe it was the second show, but I, was, it, was it the first show that you had diarrhea? And you had to shit. Like, no, it was in Denver. In Denver. Denver. Yeah, Denver. <laughs> it was fucking. I had, I had the fucking. I had diarrhea, and I was throwing. I got food poisoning somehow from something, you know, because fucking who knows what food that shit they were fucking serving up there. And me and my guitar player both got food poisoning, so we're both throwing up. We both have diarrhea. I've got a bucket on stage in Vendor in between songs. I'm running, diarrheaing into this bucket and then just going back and singing, <laughs> singing the rest of the set because can't miss the show. Okay. That's oh what I God, thought. Yeah. Was it was, it was Denver and I was standing in, um, yeah. And yeah, I went into the audience and watched your set from the, from the, uh, from this, uh, from the crowd. And the, I remember that it's just like, Oh, that's cool. 
<laughs> <laughs> just throwing up and di- like throwing up on stage diarrhea and ba- you know i'd go behind the amp to diarrhea i didn't want to like diarrhea and for- i didn't want to go full gg allen <laughs> but <laughs> uh, people think it's a it's a stage effect it's a it's a prop yeah. it's like oh shit that's nice wow how but, can but that was like that was like a that was to me that was like wow man like behemoth is like got a buzz like you guys were getting a great reaction from the audience like people were really starting to connect you know apostasy like yeah. even bigger and then evangelion am, am i saying that right evangelion yeah evangelion yeah yes that record was like holy shit like when that shit dropped everybody was just like oh my god like fuck it what the fuck are they doing over there and the videos and the, i already up until that point you guys had already in my opinion really stepped up the video game like bands weren't really making videos of that kind of dark sexual satanic you know nature and it was really dude it was really exciting i mean i remember being fucking blown away and uh and that record in particular you had colin richardson's the production was fucking savage and uh and just like to me, that so- that's your song craft, you know, in particular, you know, bow. I mean, just <laughs> it was a whole other level. I mean, at that point, you had now toured America many times. You had tasted success. I'm sure you could see, you know, that the band was in a clearly upward trajectory. What's your mindset going into this record? Are you brokenhearted again? <laughs> no, are, you in a, are you in a relationship at this point? At, at this point during Evangelion? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I, I just broke up. Okay. <laughs> another <laughs> another <laughs> no, I, I is remember. This I Dota, is this the Dota girl? No, this is, you're not with the Dota girl yet. I, I no, no, no. Uh, okay. But anyways, I think I told you that, you know, the Colly Richardson uh, choice was because of you and Slipknot, uh, because of Through the Ashes. Uh, because I love the film. I, I love that sound so much. I loved it. I was like, holy shit, I love I'm like, and I was trying to, uh, I was thinking, okay, this is, I mean, you don't really have much like all the blast beats and like, it's, it's like your music is not so dense. But uh, I was thinking, can we with our, like with all this fast speaking and this, if we get guy like Colin Richardson, can we make, can we step up, you know, can we upgrade, can we elevate our music, you know, because I was like, this record, Three the Ashes, and uh, Sleep Notes, uh, All, Hope, no, is All Hope is Gone. Yeah. And I was like, holy shit, I need that. I, I know it's like, it's like a next level uh, thing in metal, but can we bring our je- genre there? Can we? Yeah. Let's try. So that's why I was pushing so hard for Colin Richardson. That was the main reason. Yeah, uh, we even I talked was, about it on. We even talked about that on on uh, Sounds of the Underground. You're like Colin Richardson, and I was like, dude, get wait, him. We're freezing. We ta- we spoke about. You were asking how Colin Richardson was. You were asking me. We talked about that on Sounds of the Underground sometime. Oh really? Oh shit. Yeah, we were we were drinking. Know. We were just drinking one time and just hanging and yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's possible. Yeah. See. See, yeah. cool. Because yes. I wouldn't remember, you know, there's like so many uh, chats and yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm happy we made it. Yeah, I mean, it was, you said Demigod, it was one of those records. Then Apostasy, yeah, we were just pushing, did Ozfest or Mayhem or something. And then mm-hmm. Evangelion and uh, it felt like, yeah, it's growing. It's growing. And, uh, you know, it's a snowball effect, that's for sure. So, for me, it's hard to say, okay, it was a breakthrough record or this was a breakthrough record because it, with every next record, it felt like, okay, bigger venues, better offers, more recognition. Uh, the following would just, you know, would have this tendency to grow and grow. So it's hard to say. I think it was everything together, like all these factors they would put together. Uh, hard work ethics in the first place I'd say some talent probably too uh, but I always say determination and just just no fucks given attitude just 
boom, boom. They don't want us here, you know, fucking use window. Just fucking go, go. Yeah. And um, so bits of everything, you know, and, and, and of course some luck too. I'd say, you know, you got to be at the right place, right time. Because I always keep on repeating that there's billions of super talented bands out there. I cannot even count them. I cannot follow all the, all the great music that is out there. And uh, lately I've had this crisis, so to say. I'm like, because there was, I think we're, that's what I said, we're so spoiled. We were talking women, but everything. There's too much of everything, including music, including bands, including- A lot of bands, so many everything. bands. And so for me, like these days, you know, when someone's like, listen to that record, it's awesome. I'm like, man, no, no, there's too many awesome records. Every record sounds amazing. It's on maybe on one hand, it's easy to sound amazing and make a great sounding record. What I'm interested in these days is because I don't know if you notice that there's this temporary hypes, all this band is hyped, and then the hype goes like for a week now or two weeks, and then like, where's this band? Where's this album? Why no one is talking about it? And I miss those times that you make statement and you make things last, you maintain yeah. them. Uh, the album cycle is three years and it, yeah. it's diverse and it's dynamics there. And you release a video, you release another video. These days, the bands would just fucking shit out one video, one tour, uh, another record, another record. Yeah, but where's the, I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah, just for sure. Give, give me something meaningful or if you bring me the record it's not really what you did on the record anymore for me it's like what you have done with this record yeah so there's a lot of bands but i'm like you know what let's talk in 10 years okay yeah i hope you're still around you have five albums by that time you this this and that amount of tours and you make something that stood the test of time because it's very easy to ship things out these days. And I'm, I'm spoiled. I'm, it's an overkill of everything. It's just too much. And I give up. I literally stop listening to new stuff because it's just, it, it all blurs into one thing, into like magma of like, oh, there's so much music. So what I do these days, I revisit old stuff and just go back to the old stuff that I, for some reason, I missed that or I ignore that album and then I go back to the old stuff. I'm like, holy shit, you know, why I look for new stuff while there's still so much like old school music or back catalog of bands that I love? Or like what I do is like, okay, no more Slayer, pity. But maybe this is a time for me with divine intervention never been a fan of the record i'm even giving a chance to fucking diabolus in musica every now and then <laughs> and i'm like okay you know what i mean yes. the music is there already just go back and because there's probably some jewels out there you know so yeah. why looking for new stuff it's i'm not sure if it's gonna survive but slayer legacy is gonna live forever so uh maybe there's still slayer music that that i'm gonna you know dig these days you know oh metallica oh, how about load and reload you know so i go back to those records now you know like and like different optics i have different optics and i look back to those albums it's not that bad why i thought it's it's shitty back then you know it's actually there's a lot of good rock music there and yeah. so on. Like, i can name any band and just go and like like from time perspective, it looks, it, it sounds much better than back then, you know? So yeah, that is my personal problem with what's happening these days in the scene. Some, somewhere around here, you start having, uh, you have the controversy with the blasphemy, the blasphemy charge in Poland, right? Isn't this 2007 or so? 
Yeah, it was a post-season tour. Yeah, it was a post-season tour yes. uh, when uh, the Bible accident happened. Uh, <laughs> the Bible accident. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, it, uh, it you did accidentally happen. you accidentally ripped up the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> No, I meant uh, Bible incident. Okay. But, I think, but I think accident sounds uh, more humorous. <laughs> Anyways, uh, it, uh, it started, uh, the whole thing started uh, at Sansa the other gun when one of the opening bands, some Christian preaching band, maybe it was Devil's, Devil Wears Prada or something like that. Okay. Around the same bill. And there was just someone, to, like, I believe it was tour managers, like, eh. Hey, this band that will open the stage, you know, asked me to hand you the book. And I'm like, what? Seriously? And I was like, I remember like, give it to me before Christians to the Lions today. Right. What do you mean? Yeah, just hand the book to me before Christians to the Lions. And that was the moment. I mean, maybe if it was, hey, Devil Wears Prada. I don't know if uh, the band is still around. If anyone could, I don't know. I mean, like, anyone from the band or whatever, you know, it was you. You made me do it. You <laughs> fucking provoked me. Maybe the if it wasn't for... made the, you do the, it. The real devil was <laughs> Prada. The devil was Prada made Because you do if it. it wasn't you, maybe I wouldn't even come up with that not very creative uh, trick. I mean, fucking Marilyn Manson's and others did that before me. Uh, with much bigger impact and success, you know, but this thing, this incident, accident, uh, put me into legal troubles here in Poland. And the, 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 yes. the, and the, and Which the, I was quite surprised about, like that it was that big of a deal, you know, yeah. like that, that religion is that entwined into the country. Absolutely. Of Poland. Absolutely. absolutely. Uh, I mean, uh, no question about that. And, uh, yeah, a lot of, like, I got, like, two lawsuits going now and the third one in works. Also, you know, same case, blasphemy case. So, yeah. Yes. One is going to one is gonna be difficult, but uh, I hope it's winnable. Uh, so, yeah, uh, it's... But you, win, yeah. but you win that case. You do ultimately yeah. win that case. Yeah, 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 yeah. I did. And, uh, but I think what helped me was that... Uh, there was, uh, if it was these days, uh, it'd be probably way more difficult to, uh, uh, to overcome, you know, those problems. I mean, the case was, uh, the, the, it was like six years long. Wow. Six years. That's a fucking like, long time, man. Holy six shit. Years long. Uh, shit, a lot of money, of course, invested, but, um, yeah, I fucking conquered that, and, and 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 it's in the books. And I know for a fact, you know, like some law studies and stuff, you know, it is in the books. It's in the in the. Oh yeah, the, it's the, Nurgle, yeah. Nurgle versus yeah. Poland. <laughs> yeah, Nurgle Casas, you know, it's 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 it was pretty unprecedented, and now we're still battling that, you know, blasphemy Casas that has its origins in uh, in uh, medieval times. <laughs> mm -hmm. And guess what, Poland is the only remaining European country that still has that in, uh, in constitution. Crazy. Yeah, it is crazy. It is crazy. It's like, it's so archaic. It's so uh, it is. ancient. I mean, ancient things can be beautiful, but this is actually very ugly ancient uh, thing from, you know, the very past and uh, it takes its toll. And uh, I mean, <laughs> so the lo the lawsuit started in 2006 and it continued all through like the evangel Evangelian area era. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Do you do you feel like you know because somewhere around here you got leukemia? Was yeah. there any connection to just the stress of all of this kind of? Could, could be. I mean, I don't know, man. I, uh, it's uh, no doctor could tell me exactly. Okay, leukemia was caused. That was the cause of the of, of of the cancer. That was the cause of this. You know, that was that made you suffer. No, it's it's all we can do is just deliberate and we can speculate and we can guess. Yeah. 
So it could be anything really. I mean, remember we did, we had Chernobyl in uh, 80s, right? Yeah, and, well, oh, Chernobyl, yeah. Uh, yeah, Chernobyl. And uh, the cloud, the radioactive cloud went to Poland. Right. And, uh, I, you know, what they say is that it was approximately 20 years, not 20 years from now, but when I was in the hospital, it was like 20 years. So a lot of people say, like, why there's so many leukemia cases uh, blooming out in this very period, you know? So someone, hmm. you know, connected dots that is exactly um, the time for leukemia to... Um, Right. I understand what you're saying. Grow yeah. or yeah, grow. And, uh, so m maybe that had something to do with that or maybe not. I don't know, man. I mean, that must've been a scary time, man. I mean, like that must've been a really scary time in your life. And, you know, the band was on a huge upswing. I mean, tours and, you know, had you done, you'd done like a pretty, like you'd done like a good year and a half of touring or maybe two years into that album, right? Before this happened or yeah, the, was, before the diagnosis. Yeah, we were in the middle of uh, touring cycle for Evangelion. Then shit happened. And then the first thing that, you know, we came, I mean, my plan was like, okay, if I get out alive, we continue touring for Evangelion. We finish. We put mm -hmm. dot over I. Right. And uh, I remember I made pl my plans and uh, I was still in hospital in... How did you find... I mean, did you ha were you having symptoms or something? Was something... Yeah, why yeah, did yeah. you go into the hospital? Yeah, I got goosebumps all over my head. You know, the... Not the goosebumps. Uh, maybe it's goosebumps. That's the right word. Uh, like a little... You yes, know. I know what you're talking about. Lesions. Yeah. Was it called lesions? Lesions. lesions. Lesions, yeah. yeah, all over my head. I was like, holy fuck, that's weird. You know, what is that? <laughs> I remember, uh, it's funny, not funny anecdote from those times. We are playing Metal Days in Slovenia, a festival or Metal Camp, really cool festival. You probably played. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, you played there uh, in mountains. And there was, um, what's it? Uh, uh, Guys in the forest shooting each other. What's the what is hunters? Called? No. Oh, uh, like like uh, in the What's forest the shooting each other. No, or like yeah, like we're, paintball we're, or something. Paintball. Yeah, pinball, pinball, pinball. Yeah. Ah, black holes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, pinball. Yeah, <laughs> and we are we are having a pinball match with decapitated. Okay, nice. We won, of course, and uh, <laughs> but but I, <laughs> but I remember. I'm wearing these big ass glasses, but my head was uh, like, you know, like it was, you know, I had like long hair back then, but I had this mm -hmm. lesion uh, all over my head. And I remember one of those fuckers from the capitated would just like, would nail me right in the center of one of them. And it was super fucking painful. I could hide that. And just because he was in my hair, so I could hide, you know, that, that I was hit. So I, yeah. I, I think I even faked that, you know, but I remember it was hurting as fuck. And I was like, I was concerned. I was like, why do I have these weird symptoms on my head? Why it, it is a third week ongoing? I'm shitting uh, green. Ooh. Not Chris Green. Green. Not grease green? Green no, screen. Not, not grease green. That's yeah. an internal joke. <laughs> grease um, green, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm shitting green, diarrhea. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm like, mm, I'm okay. I'm working out, lifting weights, and I'm doing shows, but something's wrong with me. And then I was starting, like, I, I, I would like had this, uh, I would have this uh, very weird, like, whistling. Like when I would just breathe, like a, do like a, re a regular breathe in, breathe out, you, you could hear like this, like, like weird yeah. noise. Like, what the yeah. fuck is that? And then like, later on into the process, you know, when they checked me, it was the, uh, yeah, the cancer was like that big, like 15 centimeters big, which is this, this big, wow. and it was right in the center of my lungs. Holy and it was growing. Shit. 
So that was that would make the air, you know, uh, make it difficult for uh, for the air, for the oxygen to go through. Right. So that's why it made this weird, like that's flute crazy. Kind of noise. Yeah. That's just crazy. That's so huge. I was I, I, I was struggle like a very brutal like and and difficult like breathing problems. So basically, it was growing. So if there was, I mean, if I wasn't hospitalized at some point, or let's say I'm on deserted island, I'm dying because of I, I would just choke on that. I would just I would just suffocate myself. So yeah, yeah. And then I ended up in a hospital. So you go to you do you yeah. do chemotherapy? You do chemotherapy. Yeah. I did chemo and I did the radiation like. I did all the napalm. I received yeah. it all, you know, and I didn't even have to go to Vietnam, you know. And uh, yeah, did I you was lose blue. your hair? Did you lose yeah, your hair? Yeah, I lost all my hair. Time. I lost eyebrows. Uh, I lost all the hair, you know. I was like, I looked like a fucking uh, <laughs> like you lost your pubic hair. <laughs> You're pointing down to like your pubic hair. Right? Yes, yes, yes. Everything, <laughs> everything, everything. Yeah. Um, uh, the the Michelin uh, figure, you know, like, because <laughs> I was right. like, I, I gain weight too, you know, I get a lot of water in my, you know, oh, okay. body. So huh. I was like, like sometimes I post uh, photos from from uh, from like my, my hospital times, and people are like, first they don't, no, it's not you, well, it's me, no, it's not you, well, it's me, <laughs> yeah. I know better if it's me or not. So yeah, it was. Brutal. I mean, what? I mean, you've got to be thinking like, I mean, you could die. Like, behemoth might not never continue. What is, you know? I think a lot of times when cancer patients s survive something, it really is because they their mindset. You know, like you've got to fucking steal your mind. You know, and what? Like, what are you? You know, are you? reading stuff like are you talking to people do you have somebody who's helping you like kind of pull through this and keep your positive spirits and positive you know i had good people around me i had uh my ex-girlfriend was very much involved in uh this is the pop star yeah the pop star and she did a great job you know she would just go public with that and uh that that basically it was you know it started the avalanche you know because the number of donor, like potential donors, the bone marrow donors in Poland, the initial number, the starting number was 50,000 people. When I got hospitalized, it was 50,000. Is it much? Uh, just to, com to give you a comparison is that Germany back then had 2 million. Okay. So Poland, us on many levels, was on this one too, was in Middle Ages. Right. So uh, we would like only because of that, like within months, the numbers would go, go up to a couple of hundreds of thousands of donors in Poland only. It would just go like thousand, thousand, fifty, oh. uh, hundred thousand, two hundred thousand. After, after, 200, she, brought thousand. It, after huh? she brought it to the attention. Yeah, after yeah, yeah. Donor brought it, it to the attention. Yeah, right. It was just, it just grows so fast, you know? And I was like, yeah. Like I would, I would even think, you know, okay, if I don't make it, still like would think that something good is gonna come out of it. That's the first thing. Yeah, and right. that's something you know, like uh, like a a greater good. Okay, something bigger than just my my case. You know, people fucking die. Okay, we all yeah. gonna die. That was too early for me, but you know, there's good happening. You're, you were thirty in your th 34, 35, was, something like that. Yeah, yeah. I was thirty. I was uh, thirty. If it was if it was thirty three, I would understand that. Oh. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, I think I was thirty four or five. Yeah. Right. Uh, anyways, I would. Um, I don't know, man. I think that I would. I, I had fears, of course, you know, and I was concerned, and I I didn't want to die. I was like, I was hungry. I, I'm I'm a very vital person. But at the same time, I don't think. And ever since, I think I gr I've grown here this um, uh, this understanding of of cycles and uh, the birth and death and uh, 
how the world works and how just I just acknowledge the fact that you know the death is I mean it's a taboo in today's civilized so-called world you know but if you travel to Asia or like you know it just death is not a taboo you know people mourn of course you know but like these days, you know, everyone wants to live forever. Everyone wants to be forever young, you know, and we go nuts because of that, right? And uh, I think it's, it takes a lot of class and maturity and understanding to acknowledge the fact, no, I'm aging, I'm using myself, and I'll start falling apart sooner or later, and I will die, and I know it. And I embrace that. It's not going to scare me. It's not going to take away my joy for life. It's not going to take away my stamina, my vitality. No fucking way. I'm going to go away when my time comes. But maybe that time, it wasn't my time. So that's how I see that, basically, you know. And... um yeah, and uh, I would just make plans. I would make plans with the band. I would just tell my doctors, so how are we going to plan it out? You know, this, you know, like a strategy thing, you know, just you're running a, uh, a chess match, you know, just okay, boom, 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 boom. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, me and my lawyer and my friend, we just meet on those sessions like we do now. And he was great in chess and we'd just play chess together. Oh yeah. Over Zoom yeah. or whatever. Yeah. 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 It was awesome. Just Skype or something, you know, but it was awesome. That's how we just occupy, my, occupy myself, read a lot, uh, listen to music. Uh, I would get like a bunch of like behemoths, uh, album covers. We just released DVD while I was in the hospital. I would just navigate everything from the hospital bed, you know, and I would wow. just get, I would just get diggy packs, sign them, and I would, honestly, I would just, I remember I was sitting there, thinking, "Hey, Nergo, if this is the last 500 pieces you are signing for Behemoth, make sure the signatures are nice." <laughs> I remember thinking that way, because why not? You never know. But yeah. then at the same time, I would just think, okay. I'll be released in January. I'll get back to my shape, you know, around spring. So October, I want to start touring. Yeah. Everyone was like, oh, maybe it's too early or maybe just don't make these plans, you know, because then you're going to be disappointed or this or that. And I would just tell my doctor, I mean, if I don't go back on stage and if I cannot continue tour, it doesn't make sense for me to to um, to get healthy. Yeah, what are you living for? Yeah, that's that's yeah. what it is. It's who I am. So October. So, as I said, in, in this period, in, as, in as this I, period, is this where? Yeah. So you you come at you come out of it. You start making the tour plans, and is this the point where you film the loose fur video? Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. Yes. I was, it's like coming, it was, coming out of your yeah, yeah. whole experience. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, I was like, okay, we're still in the middle of a touring cycle. Let's make another final video for Evangelion. It's going to be Lucifer. Let's make it fucking big and just. Dude. Yeah. Let me just tell you that video fucking blew my mind. It was so dark and fucked up and sexy and beautiful and weird and i was like holy shit i mean i think everybody everybody i know when they saw that video was like oh my god like shit just went to another level like you you changed the game right there like everybody went oh fuck that's where we can go you know, and in some, it was it was funny because in some ways, I remember the first time that I saw the Rapture video and how blown away I was by that video. Just like, what the fuck? That's what you can do with videos. And I remember having a similar feeling for that. Like, oh, you can do that. You know, it was just and the fucking girl with the blood and she's naked and she's so fucking hot. And I was like, oh, my God. You know, like it was just everything like, you know, you could get aroused. You could get angry. You could get fucking tripped out. Like it was 
fucking uh, evil and awesome. Yeah, I remember. I mean, I was what, a, what, a, what an inspiration you must have had to like just, you know, this may be the last thing that I ever do. You know, who yeah. fucking knows? Like, what, like life is so short. You just go through this crazy yeah. experience. And- yeah, it it kind of, I mean, I must say that this experience kind of made me way more, I don't know if the word, word, word belligerent is the right one here. Belligerent, I guess that it's, it, it has a negative connection, right? But what I mean is that I just, I just became more uh, just sincere with myself and with the world. And uh, I, I'm like, no, nah, I, I'm, not, I'm not, not wasting my time. Like you want to say something, you want to do something, fucking do it. Do it. You want to like that girl? Go and tell her that you like her. Don't waste any more time. Just do it. You want to write that song? Fucking do it. You, you know, someone will think it's funny or you're pathetic or whatever. Fuck them. This is it. It's not them who will be in, your, in the same coffin. It's just you. You're going to be right. in the coffin, you know? I mean, why, why are we even thinking about other people? They're not in your head. They're not you. They're not... They have different experience, so um, yeah, it kind of changed like my whole perspective on 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 art. On I don't know, it's not not really changed, but it kind of amplified what I had before. But I was kind of shy to express. But from that moment, I was like, "Let's go, let's march right. on." You know, just that's it. You know. You're my friend. You're my enemy. This is music I love. I like that girl. Let's do it. You know, let's make life easier. And 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 just you know, just carry on with what with what we have. And I think that that's what it's been ever since. You know, it's just um, uh, yeah, a continuous you know journey full of like very exciting things you know it's it's been what like nine years now i believe yeah. since i was um yeah nine years and uh i must honestly honestly say that like best things have happened to me or like one of the best experiences and trips and 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 situations some some pretty dramatic too but still best you know what i mean I'm not mm-hmm. like collecting only great things, you know, just these were great. These were really shitty, but I'm so thankful for a shit experience too. Very important, you know, because it built that guy. And every time I look in the mirror, I'm like, at least I'm not ashamed of myself. Right. You know, and, and, and I'm definitely smarter than, than yesterday. And that is very important too. So... Yeah, I think I learned my lesson. But then again, I think I'm still processing that whole experience, that the, the, the whole like the six months, because that was the period, you know, from the start when I was diagnosed to the moment that I was released, it was six months, which is nothing really. I mean, a lot of people say like, what, six months only? Yeah. But it was very brutal. It was very intense, like head-to-head chemo sessions, hardly any time at home. You know, they would just they would um, send me home maybe like three times for maybe three days only. So I would just be basically wow. nailed to the to the uh, to the hospital bed for six months. Uh, but hey, it worked. Can you, uh, let's, we can end, end with this. Can you tell us anything about what's ha- I'm not sure if you can talk about what's going on with the trial or anything that's I going can. on with them. Okay. I can. I mean, uh, there's few trials going now. One is, uh, about, the you know, me or us, because it's three people, uh, in charge disrespecting the yeah. Polish emblem. It's your, it's your webmaster, right? Your webmaster is involved webmaster. in it somehow. Man, it's, it's, it, what the fuck? It's a lot of Ma- absurd. Masek? Yeah. I'm not saying if I'm so, Masek, yeah. I'm not sure if I'm saying his name right. Yeah, Maciek, Maciek Mancikor. Maciek, uh, yeah, right. But, nice but guy. We, Super nice we, guy. Are, we already won that case like a year ago or two years ago. 
and now they mm -hmm. reopen that because oh, why I think they, why did they reopen it? Then there's some. I mean, I don't know any of like like technical nuances why they could re reopen it because I I'm not a lawyer and I that's not my way of thinking. So I'm like, okay, they had this right to revisit it and reopen it because apparently some people could have now I don't remember should have been investigated on the top of that some uh, Catholic um, organization called Ordo Iuris who are like Catholic police got involved now so they had to reopen it only because of that fact and some other facts but um, I think it's gonna I don't know I only, all I hope is that it's 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 an absurd case it's stupid and we're gonna win it again that's what i hope for the other case that a lawsuit that is going is against me i got this uh art figure made by tom warrior from celtic frost it's a huge deal though uh, with a uh, jesus nailed to that <laughs> and i awesome. use it and I, it I know and it's beautiful too and uh and i you just wave it on my Instagram singing a song. And that is the reason. You've got a lawsuit because of that? Yeah, and uh, my That's lawyer crazy. said, yeah, I know. My lawyers, they claim that it's, I mean, it sounds like an absurd. Again, you know, because like, like for, we had the first court meeting and I'm like, like, grand, like I, I'm, confronting judge and i'm like hey my social media i do like professional stuff there i do social stuff i do uh, self-promotion i talk about others cool things but also it's a big big part of my social media is humor and i'm explaining that in a court and uh, i admit that a lot of my humor is uh first of all not politically correct because I'm a fan of, you know, Borat and this is, for me, this is the ultimate uh, uh, joke, okay? So some of that stuff, I, claim, I, I admit that some of that stuff might be too much. Some of that stuff might be stupid. And yeah, I, some of my jokes might be missed. And I claim that, you know? Some of the jo my jokes might be cool and some, eh, not very cool. Times, okay? And I admit that. And I have no problems admitting sorry if someone felt weird about that. But then in the end of the day, this is my fucking social media. If you don't like porn, you don't go to the porn movies. If you don't like uh, 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 church, I don't go to church during mass because I, would, I know I would get easily irritated. So I don't do that. Just do not enter. That's what my bio on both accounts, Facebook and Instagram, says, guess why in Polish only? Do not enter because the content you may find blasphemous and, you know, whatever. So there's a warning. Why do I why, yeah. I, why, why did I put a, a warning in Polish only? And, it, it, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm talking to court now. Why it's in Polish only? Because only Polish people uh, are so sensitive. Or in other words, I would say, because there's fucking plenty of opportunists in Poland that just target Nurgle because I'm an easy target because they know that if they take me to the court, next day headlines are gonna be theirs. And yeah. if they win the case, they'll feel strong. But how much it says about them and their faith, how weak it is, that the guy waving a, a, a thing on an Instagram makes you weep and it makes you yeah. cry like a bitch and just, just go to the court, really? So yeah. how come no priest takes me to the court? How come no bishop does that? You know why? Because they don't give a fuck. Because, yeah. because this is bullshit. This is just some guys 
social media. And I'm, again, you know, like I'm confronting the judge and I'm saying that publicly that never ever I would dare to go and preach in the street or scream at other people in the street or, uh, you know, slander Catholics or whatever. I don't have problems with Catholics. I have friends that are Catholics. I just have problems with people entering my temple, entering my club, going on their uh, wish on my social media to get offended. Mm -hmm. It's some kind of masochism. I mean, why you would even do it? Just fucking avoid me. Easy peasy, yeah. I'll follow. Yeah, so, that's a really random one. I gotta say, that's a really, that's a kind of a crazy line for people to cross. That you so got offended what, by I, somebody's social media and now you're suing them over that. So I'm gonna show you something now that happened lately. So I used that uh, face mask. I cannot uh, show it fully because that's what I got ticket for. Okay. Uh, so if I don't show it because uh, <laughs> it says, mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, uh, let me ask you a rhetoric rhetorical question. Can you put a mask on um, saying fuck Republicans and just wear it publicly? You could. I mean, you'll get shit for it, but you could, yeah. Okay. Will you get a penalty ticket for that or not? You don't get a ticket. You might get beat up, but you, you of course you won't get a ticket. No. Uh, do you get a ticket for the word uh, uh, just just for you know if, when you put uh, with the word fuck on your Instagram? No. No. Okay. That's what it, because my mask says in Polish. Mm -mm -mm, P.I.S. I cannot right, say that right, because right. I know for a fact, just, just know that the prosecutor's office, he's watching my Instagram, just waiting to get calls to call police and bring me to court. And he admitted right. that. So yeah. I cannot do a lot of, of that stuff because he's watching. And this is a ticket that I got. It's not much, oh but basically yeah. I, I paid a uh, hundred zlotys, which is... We beat that down from 100 uh, euro to 20 euro, which is not much. But I must say that it's really worth to pay 20 euro to say, fuck P-I-S. This I can say because it's English and they're not very educated. So they probably don't know what it means. Anyways, fuck them. Fuck establishment. Fuck that system. And I fuck cross my the Catholic thing. police. Fuck the Catholic police. And uh, yeah, please cross fingers for this Sunday election because I truly hope there's going to be a change of, uh, uh, you know, in the position of our president because we desperately need that. We need enlightenment. We need a, oh, okay, three right. hours uh, interview. It's probably three hours. Three hours. Three of, of music. That was awesome. That was awesome, man. I really wow. uh, thank you for this. This was a fucking great interview, man. Are you? Are you? Oh, it's my pleasure. My pleasure, and I'm really happy because uh, that's also what I. I mean, that's we started with that, you know, COVID, what it did to me. Usually, when you know, when there's a, I don't know if you had that, you know, if there's a touring cycle or you have album out, you know, you got all these schedules, interviews, twenty minutes. Okay, you go do this mm. pod podcast, you know, 45 minutes. Right. Uh, there's always something. There's always something wait, uh, waiting. During COVID, during isolation, there's no deadlines. So I already did some like, like stuff like that, you know, that I have all the time in the world. We can talk stuff that is maybe taboo for others, or I can just be myself and I'm not rushed by anything. So I can just freely talk about stuff with an old friend of mine, not very old, but uh, <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? And it, it's a big advantage. And it's another thing that we're benefiting, you know, from the fact that we don't have these tight schedules, you know, that we can do oh. stuff like that, you know, because during album cycle, I don't think it would be possible me touring somewhere. 
uh, 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 rough. Yeah, 40 minutes. You know what I mean? Right, right. Totally. So this, totally. I mean, this is, this yeah. is amazing, you know? I mean, maybe like to, to, to wrap it up, you know, maybe COVID just is teaching us how to slow the fuck down and how to enjoy the processes, you know? Don't rush them. Enjoy the process of the interview. Three hours, some bullshit talking, some very serious talking, some jokes, some good laughs, some tears maybe. I don't know, man, but it was uh, super cool talking. Super cool. It was great. Thank you for being here, man. Thank you. Awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, Nurgle from Behemoth, the mighty, mighty Behemoth, right here on No Fucking Regrets with Rob Flynn. No fucking regrets! With Rob Flynn.